Chasing the Racing, powered by Colchester Kawasaki, part of the Global Moto Group. We supply new Aprilla, Moto Guzzi, Vespa, Royal Enfield, Kawasaki, Sim, Mutt, and Benelli motorcycles. Three, two, one, and welcome back to the Chasing the Racing episode 164. And we're delighted to be joined by Rocket Ron Haslam. How's it going? Yeah, really good. You know, uh, it's nice to have a you know a summer summer's day at the farm. So yeah. Yeah. That's what, it's actually nice for you to be home. We've just overheard your busy schedule between you and your son there. It's like, it must be nice to be home for a change instead of running around the place. It is, you know. Uh, I know Leon's been around the world all the time, so I've been going with him everywhere. So, yeah, oh, it's, it's great. At home, it's uh, one of the kids' birthday as well, so we've got a bit of a party happening on the lawn. So, yeah, it's fantastic. Uh, we've either done you a favour or a hindrance. We've either taken it away and done you a good thing or we're going to get you in trouble later on. So apologies for that. So it's good to have you. It's really good to have you. It's really nice how you've uh, sort of stayed close as a family and you all kind of live together and work together in different ways. And uh, it's like a nice, uh, do you know how a lot of families kind of they get to 17, 18 and all spread around the world and stuff. It's it's nice that you've got like a proper family hub. Yeah, it is. Uh, as I say, we can't get rid of them, basically. <laughs> Yeah, not by choice. <laughs> yeah, no, the uh, the all around the ass, stones throw away, uh, converted all the barns and asses, uh, all that. So yeah, they all uh, we're all happy together, really. You know, so and obviously we've got kids, so it's fantastic. And we've just uh, enjoyed a good tour around the museum, which is in- unbelievably impressive, and some like great uh, great memories for you and the, the family and the, the history and stuff. And also got introduced to a few of your pets, and uh, yeah, was it a, a big pet tour? Yeah, uh, obviously because it, it is a farm. Um, I would say the museum though is uh, my wife's idea. Anne, uh, she did all that. Um, that was just all piled up in a heap. You know, from over the years, you just keep chucking leathers down and down. And she decided to do that. So, you know, credit credit where it's due. There, she did all that. Uh, but the pets and all that, yeah, they just keep turning up. You know, what, like one of the things I like most was seeing the how knee sliders have evolved over the years. Just <laughs> <laughs> looking at the there's a set from the TT. Above the leathers is the picture of you jumping and with the chain coming off, and the set of the knee sliders then were just like duct tape, big chunks of like acrylic, basically. Oh, acrylic, leather, anything that would go, you know. Because I mean, them days, it uh, I suppose you didn't look the smartest because it was anything that worked. So tend to big pieces of leather, duct tape, because uh, the velcro got wore away. Because you tried to you tried to go too far with the the knee sliders, took the velcro off, so. It wasn't like we sort of kept putting new leathers in and all that. Like these days, they've got like three, four sets of leathers. You know, uh, if you've seen up there, my first set, it's got that many times been to cobblers. It's got all different colour shapes and passages on them everywhere. Uh, and that's where it wore them. You know, that's how it wore. Here's a question When did that like style come into play? You know, the knee down style? You know, because obviously it, someone at some point started going, I'm going to pop something on my knees. And you could see that through your leathers. So when did that yeah. come into play, do you think? That come in early on my side when I started, uh, and it come from America. Uh, oh, right. your, your Kenny Roberts and uh, your Steve Bakers and all, so, you know, the early the early versions of all them. Um, so pre that, did you, nobody used to put anything on the ground? No, they, they used to just sit upright, more of a um, um, Mike Elwood, you know, the Mike Elwood style, because obviously I had the pleasure of actually, you know, following around the Isle of Man. Uh, oh, when, wow. when, he, when he had, you know, he had his comeback, you know, uh, on the Ducati and, uh, I had the real pleasure of actually, I was on the Wakes Honda at the time, uh, and he'd on the Ducati that wasn't very quick. And every time we just straight, I'd pass him, you know, because we are on the road together. Uh, as soon as then, I didn't know where I was, he'd come back past me again. And it was just fantastic to see. And to see that style, what you're on about, you know, he just never moved. You know, he just, him and the bike was a perfectly upright, you know, position. Uh, didn't put his knee out, didn't hang off, didn't do anything. But Christ, you're quick. He used to burn his, like, go through to his toes. There's, like, famous photos of him actually melting through his boots. He used to use more of his toes as a gauge on that element side of things, wasn't it? Is that right? It is right, because I started doing that early on in my days. You know, boots yeah. used to go through really quick. Um, and you've got your little toe filed a bit halfway down, you know, because you don't realise it's actually doing as much damage as it is when it does do it. So, yeah, basically, the side of your boot goes. And that was the first one. It, it progressed from that into your knee down and... Uh, Stuff like that. No, it's like elbow and almost arm. <laughs> Them pictures are like Quattararo and, and uh, there was one of Martin the other day. And they're literally like an inch above getting the shoulder down on the curbs. It's like crazy. Yeah. Nice. Oh, it's crazy now. They, they're using them for everything. They're using them to save slides. Um, obviously, progression and all on tyres and handling and all that. 
the angles you can get to now is you know incredible compared to what you used to able to you yeah. know with tires and all that bit so yeah knees elbows everything's going down now just, yeah. just to quickly touch back on the the farm the um obviously you've got like a few different pets around the house and stuff but over the years what's like the maddest pets that you've had Oh, uh, we've we've had quite a few. Um, we tend to get all the rejects, basically. <laughs> you know, um, yeah. So all those dogs aren't. There's no pedigrees in anything. You know, it's uh, uh, Emma uh, M- Miguel. She had one because at that time it was a Chihuahua. Because in fashion it was these handbag dogs, weren't they? You know, uh, yeah, great. It lasted about two weeks and it went from here to us. So then we were looking <laughs> after it. So that was that one. Leon's got a couple now. Uh, we've had a few from RFPCA. You know, um, so we've got a farm. So you know, we like the dogs and everything. We've, we've got dogs farm, um, dogs, chickens, goats, uh, tortoise that wanders all over the ta- all over the floor. So Massive yeah, the tortoise. It's it that is, yeah. ridiculously big. Yeah. Now normally like a house one's like right about the size of your palm. This yeah. is not even exaggerating. If you're watching this on YouTube, it's half the table. It yeah. is massive. It is, yeah. Well, yeah. Did you used to have a mon- a pet monkey? I had. A, uh, I've had a pet <laughs> monkey, uh, Mindy. Its name we called. Yeah. Um, that's when it was actually. To be honest, that was when I was living with my mother uh, in the council <laughs> house in Langley Mill, and it used to live in the outside toilet. <laughs> you know, like so. Yeah, that was fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. We, can't, we can't just skate over this. What possessed you to get? How did you end up with a monkey? <laughs> One of the main sponsors, Mal Carter, that started all my career off and, hmm. well, the old family's career. Uh, and he was into all this different animals and all that. And he but he got two. I don't know where the hell he got from. I never asked. You know, he got male and female. <laughs> and he had the male because it was bigger. Now I had the female. And, uh, yeah, I sort of brought it up, but, oh, it was wild. You know, there's, a, oh. there's a story in Alan's book about um, Mal had what they're called when they've got the body and then they've got a long neck. Even and, llama. Llama, yeah. Llama. I know, a llama, yeah. A llama once bit Alan and he came, he told his dad, like, oh, I think he was ch- going around the garden on a motorbike and, he the, was. and the llama had bit him. And he'd said to his dad, oh, that llama's just bit us. And his dad just got a, a gun out and just put it to the head and just shot the llama in front of him and said, oh, that won't happen again. So I was something like that. You're having yeah. us on. No, no, that's it. No, that's that, was, that was true. Yeah. yeah. But what's missing is uh, Alan was actually teasing it on a motocross bike. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. in the book, yeah. Is it in the book? Yeah, yeah. that was true, because I know about that. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was hard ground, you know, frozen ground, and he would only get really close to him because it was chasing him, and then he'd set off on the motocross bike to, you know, so it wouldn't catch him. But this time, he, he let the clutch go too quick, hard ground, it spun its wheel, and it took a nice big piece out of his back. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I thought, oh, yeah, that's that saves you right, but then the next bit didn't uh, yeah, didn't, no. get, didn't come come quite right. And uh, you mentioned there that uh, so Alan's dad Mal, yeah. um, which was Farrow Racing, that yeah. that started off you and you was it both your brothers as well? You yeah, um, how all that started off a real quick one because most you know most everybody knows knows the story of that. But uh, my brother started first uh, production racing. Um, they were just labourers basically, so they just funded it itself uh, production racing, and then they got one bike together because they couldn't afford it. Uh, Philip was good, uh, the uh, the other brother, and uh, Mal Carter seen him, and he just, you know, Mal Carter was a fanatic, you know, like, you know, I mean, he didn't gain anything on what you call, you know, for adv- advertising, all that, he was just a fanatic on it, he did it, he raised himself and everything, and they picked Philip up, and uh, obviously went a long way with him when the Barachin, uh was about, you know, when Barachin was at the top, you know, um, so he did really well, but then obviously he had a tragic accident at Scarborough. Um, and when that happened, then um, Mal Carter then uh, looked to me because I was young uh, and gave me the opportunity. And it just built from there, really. Yeah. Cause... So he was fantastic, bloke. You know, he was uh, a rough diamond, they used to call him. Um, and he was definitely rough. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So did he just say like oh, anyone shooting alarmers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely put that as yeah rough. <laughs> yeah, so you fancied racing, and did he just buy, buy you a bike and like you essentially ran you in it? Yeah, he um, on my side it was just it. Was, I mean, at this point, then I'd just got a normal job, uh, builder, you know, uh, standard, uh, you know, building jobs, you know, and all that stuff, labour. Um, 
And then he come up with this opportunity where he said, do you want to ride some bikes? I love bikes because that's what I've been around all his life. Um, and he just says, yeah, yeah. Um, and he just, he took three bikes at me straight away, Yamaha's. Um, three? Yeah, three straight did, at me. Did, you know. he, did he go, oh, I need just the one? Or was God, it just yeah. like... It was like, wow. You know, and the, we've got to realise, I'm in a council last year, you know, bringing just a, you know, standard wage and, and all that. And you pay your board to your mum, obviously feed you and all that stuff. Um, so I find it dead odd to even get to meetings and back, you know, which that was a really odd one for me, that one. Um, but uh, I got through it, you know, you know, I won't say legally ways, but I got through it, you know, siphoning petrol and all that stuff, you know, <laughs> to get to meetings and all, you know, anything what you had to do, you know, couldn't, keep, couldn't keep a job because straight away uh, at that time, it was been Mallory Park Wednesday, Cadwell Thursday, practice. You know, like, so as soon as you start doing that, you, you build a man says, no, it's no good for us. <laughs> you know, like, so that was all. So then I signed on Dole for ages, you know, and uh, so I'm getting me Dole to get, because I've got no money coming in, because I'm not that good. I'm not getting money, basically. So I signed on Dole for about a year, and uh, then the Dole man got me, put all the papers in front of me, and says, uh, where's all this money coming from? You know, like, because, you know, they say, you know, we paying you Dole, yet you're in the most of the papers, you're winning this, you're winning that, and that's, well, that's the sponsor. <laughs> so I just took that to Mal, that's no to do with me, you know. So I got away with that one a bit. You know? <laughs> it's yeah. mad, it's mad in a sport that's predominantly... <laughs> that's not me. Yeah, yeah that's got it, your, that. it's, yeah. it's got your face on it. It's not me. I'm no, telling you now, in the great it. words of Shaggy, it wasn't me. Yeah. <laughs> it's, um, <laughs> do you know, in a sport, which uh, the sort of, even the entry point, point it's so expensive to get into it so to to get to have an opportunity from from that background is brilliant uh, yeah. was this at this point had you lost one brother at scarborough i'd lost philip at scarborough which uh terry first started and harry started racing which i've skipped um he bought a road bike and uh norton dominator and got banned off the road within two weeks. <laughs> so went racing with it. And that's Spe how the Aslam started racing. You know. Was it speed or dangerous riding or a bit of both, really? Speed. Speed, yeah. just flat out. Speed, <laughs> yeah. Talking yeah. on. <laughs> yeah, because he just thought that he's bought this bike and it was like the norm. Uh, it was the fastest on the road, you know, and in his head, that was it. He, he was it, you know. And he, he went to Castle Park with it, didn't he? Thinking he was going to wipe the floor. You know, and at the time, uh, there was Bonnevilles at uh, 650 Bonnevilles and mm. 751. Well, he was on a Norton Dominator 1000. So to him, the CC, it's, I've got it. My bike's better than all there and it's bigger, <laughs> you know, basically. <laughs> well, they went out first race, and I'm not joking, it was more than last. <laughs> you know, like, he got such a shock, you know. Uh, but said it pulled him off, it went the opposite way. He just dug in and tried, you know, to get better. So, yeah, <laughs> so that's how it all first started. I, I must ask, before we go down this rabbit hole even further, what, what were your parents thinking of all this? It was just like... Well, as I say, my mum, uh, my mum looked after us all. Yeah. You know, um, my dad, I didn't really know much. Um, yeah. Because it wasn't, it wasn't quite that good, to be fair, mm. uh, in the family side of it. Yeah. Um, but that's that's just another thing. Um so my dad weren't there. Uh, my mum looked after everybody, but we, there was uh, ten of us all together. You know, seven brothers, three sisters. So, Jesus, so there was a house full anyway. I bet Christmas know. was fun around that place, yeah. wasn't you? <laughs> yeah. So uh, that was that was pretty good. You know, the brothers sort of looked after you know all that. Um, it's a big family, that. Isn't it? it was, yeah. You know, it uh, as I say, it's you know you say all these odd times and that, but they were good times anyway. You know, it was good. Uh, sort of the brothers just went to work. Chuck the uh, wage packet on the table. My mum got the food out of it and getting the money back, you know, what they could back. And that was that was the system. You know, like, didn't matter what year, and you just go, you know, mum, there we are. She looks after us all and then she gives you so much back to it and that, and that was generally it. <laughs> you know, like and then obviously it got better and better as the years went on. Yes. Yeah. You know. Uh, so yeah, so that's uh, so yeah, uh, my first brother, um, he uh, he started it. Then the younger brother to him, Philip, he started up, and he was actually better because he was younger <laughs> the, and everything. Here yeah. comes the brotherly thing. Yeah. Here we are. So yeah, yeah so uh, he got the sponsor of Mal Carter. I'd uh, say, but then as a quick story on it, it first brother got accident at Scarborough. Uh, he broke down uh, and somebody hit him basically, so it wasn't his fault, you know. And Jeez. then my second brother went into sidecars because he didn't quite get the solos. You know, he was actually a bit older. He were forty two, for, uh, forty one. No, 41 and then going up to 42 so I went into sidecars and to be honest I had a lot of success in sidecars it was it was, it was good it was on it you know um, but then I think it was Aston um, brakes failed and that was another tragic one so. was this before you started racing? no um, the first brother Philip 
uh, that was before I started racing. And then Malk picked me up because because of that. Mm. Um, what age were you then? I first had a ride with, on my brother's bike when I was 15 at Cadwell. Um, <laughs> so that was on Norton Dominator. Cause that's all we got. <laughs> you so, know, like, so all then, like no scrambling his kit, like no. nothing. You went straight on straight the black away. stuff straight away. Straight away. Well, you, basically what you did then was MOT failures. You used to go down canals or fields or whatever, you know, that were it. You know, like... I think you know, if you paid more than a fiver for the bike, it were a lot. <laughs> you know, like, you know, it, uh, one of them things, you know. But uh, so yeah, I went from there um, straight onto track. You know, um, Jesus. yeah, it was, it was good. Did you like you know at that point? You know, obviously, you know, you, you you've seen your brothers and you're like you're watching the bike race. And was it just like we on the sidelines at this point, going, I need to be a part of this, or was it more I want to beat me brothers? <laughs> it uh, competition, obviously, with the brothers. Yes, yeah, that's I... normal, uh, but not. I would say it was never, um, never that harsh, you know. Uh, to beat the others, very harsh. You know, yes. like you got to beat everybody else, you know. Um, there was more. It was more trying to get it done, you know. So it was sort of everybody, you know, you pitched in to buy a van and a, you know, whatever, you know, to to get you sent there. And it was more of a, a join together to make it happen. You know? Yeah. And I say Mal Carter was the biggest, uh, the biggest thing for us. Yeah. I- how did, if you don't mind me, how did Mal, how did Mal appear? You know, your brother just went, came home with a, Here at Cad- a Mal Carter. Yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> Cadwell Park, um, Mal Carter rode himself. It was a big, big fella, you know, mm. big, quite heavy fella. Um, and it was absolutely, to be honest, a nutter. You know, like, it crashed nearly every race. You know, like, Mal, this, this is the sponsor, Mal Carter. Hard as nails, but crashed every race. And uh, it seen my brother Philip uh, riding again him. And uh, it was that impressed. That's where it all started. He just says, "Look, you know, do you want to have a go on my bike, basically?" Right. And it, and it was just he rode his bike, and yeah, it, it sort of followed suit straight away from that. Um, yeah, fell in love with the family. Do you know, you said so. It started off with you had three bikes. What three classes were you in there? Uh, I went two fifty and three fifty, and uh, then he got me one. It was a little bit later when I say three bikes. It was a, then a seven fifty two stroke. And did yeah. you compete in all three classes at the yes. same time? Yeah. Right, so a lot of practice. A lot of practice, away. yeah. yeah. And um, how did your first sort of few years go? I think that's why I come across real fast because I went from club level to national to international in nearly a year, you wow. know, straight through uh, because I'd, I was doing that many classes. Mm-hmm. Uh, as I say, I was, I was out f- a couple of times I was out in every race except for the sidecar, you know, <laughs> you know the, the national level in England, you know. Uh, and I can, you know, I suppose me a little bit of glory. I did it twice at international level. That's again Randy Mamolas and the Americans. I won every class. Wow. That were Alton Park and then a smaller class, a national class. Wow. But uh, you know, it was fantastic. I never even had time to do the sighting lap. You know, like you do the warm up lap, or you want to call it. I didn't take time. It was come in, jump over the barrier, and they used to let you then because it was it was a lot more relaxed. You know, uh, jump over the barrier, go on the next bike, and it always worked out. It was either one two five because I went on one two five there as well, and then next race was seven fifty. Oh god, it was terrible. You know, like it was good, it was fantastic excitement. Yeah. You know, take uh, a lap or two just to get your breaking yeah, marks. Oh, breaking points was <laughs> the big one. You know, uh, the bonus of it is it was the always the the worst bit was you used to close the throttle on the one two five and then go oh shit, open it again. I'm nowhere near yet. <laughs> you know, like you know, where at least it was that way, not the other way around. Yeah, yeah. Say. yeah. <laughs> And uh, was it around that time that you you were awarded MCN Man Man of the Year? Yeah, um, once I'd done a lot in England, um, and I started you know winning a few bits and, and what have you, you know. So yeah, it uh, I think it was the normal thing. Barashin at the time was the the top, you know. He he was the one that you got to try and you know impress or knock off the pedestal basically. Uh, and I just started about getting nearly there, you know, with that. Mm. Um, and it's like anything, it sounds bad. They always like the underdog. Well, Barry Sheen was, you know, fantastic bloke. Uh, but he got factory bikes, you know, and I'm not saying that's that's why I won. He was a good rider. Uh, and I was the one that, you know, half the time I don't go fairing on my bike, you know, because I've not got time. You know, like, so I was the underdog, basically. Uh, and the crowd loved it, you know. So, yeah, when you say man of the year, it, it helped along that way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, but, 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 but like you know, at this point, I'm just thinking how you know within a year you went through all them classes. Yeah. What was your like, What was your drive at that point? Just to think, I need to get to there to race Barry Sheen kind of thing. Was that what was? You all... just aim for the top. You know, you, you, so the the first bit is is yes, the smaller classes I'll be dead on. So I didn't like them. 
but you had to do them to get to the higher classes, you know. Yeah. So, but I was lucky where they did actually let me, you know, he took me in to get a load of mileage on every class. Um, but I finished up just doing the, you know, the super white class uh, at the end of it because that's the one, I, you know, that's the ultimate. Yeah. What, what was it about the smaller bikes that you didn't like? Was it just because of the power of the I big think, bike? Yeah, it, I don't know. It's like anything. It's, I suppose, it's this thing where, you know, more power in your hand and faster brakes and harder to stop. It was just more exciting, you know, mm. than than sort of run, running lots of corner speed and angles and stuff like that. It was more exciting to have that. And I think the bigger bikes at the time, uh, it was 750 Yamaha or two-stroke at the time that was my era at that point. And the bike was actually competitive, you know, really good. Uh, Yamaha brought a bike out there, a two-stroke, that was, it was nearly capable of winning factory bikes, you know, like your sheens and stuff. So that made it really exciting. It meant that you weren't on the back foot, you know, it was basically down to you. Uh, that's that's what I enjoyed a lot. Um, and I say Barashin, when I didn't know him, I thought it was the normal Londoner, you know, person that, you know, you go, oh, Christ, yeah, he's on this high pedestal type thing. Get to know him, we don't like that. You know, it was absolutely down to earth, grand. Because he come to me one go at Mallory Park and he says, and he says, he says, uh, you want to just slow down a bit, you know, slow down a little bit, he says. And uh, it says, if you slow down a bit, you'll go faster. And uh, I looked at, oh, yeah, yeah, Barry Sheen is talking to me. Wow. You know, uh, and said, nodding me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I walked away. First thing that were in my head, it's frightening me. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> that was me thinking, it's frightening me. He's telling me to slow down. But it was the best information that he ever gave me, to be honest. No, no. I, was, I, I was too airy, you know, and crashing too much, basically. And he was saying, if you slow off a bit, you'll get more mileage and, and so actually it was good information you were giving me but I didn't think at the time I just thought I'm on it I'm getting yeah. it you know like which was fantastic you know? that, but how long did that information take to sink in that's what I want to know that like oh, was it a few races well Mallory Park that war uh, I think I broke my collarbone in that race coming out of the airpin <laughs> you know I've got a picture of me like flying through the air with me all ripped off my boot and everything I thought you know and I think when I hit the floor I thought I sort of thought back to that and went it's probably right, you know. <laughs> One of the best bits in the museum is all the screws that you've got in that oh. cabinet of yours and Leon's for different brain. What uh, talk us through your, your injuries through the years? What what injuries? Yeah, um, I was quite lucky. You, you break a lot of stuff, you know. Um, so yeah, you go for. Um, I went for more arms, fingers, legs, collarbones was a big one on me. Um, but that was to do with the helmet, to be fair. I I got the uh, first helmet that come out, the big, you know, full-faced helmet was a bell helmet. You know, it was like the, the, the first up-and-coming one. And the chin piece was so low on it, I didn't realise. I think it was the fifth collarbone I broke when the actual doctor says there's something breaking them because it's breaking straight through the same break. He says, and that shouldn't be possible. And I realised any time I got a little bang on the back of the head, the chin piece breaking the collarbone. Yeah, right. so was it, I, a lot of collarbones on that one. Was yeah. it just you getting that break then, or was it everyone wearing the lid? I think it would have been everyone, but I yeah. think I would got more odds because I think I crashed more than the others. <laughs> there, <laughs> there is that. There so, is. yeah, so uh, that was that side of it. But, uh, you know, um, arms, legs, fingers, you know, that's a Cadwell Park one, um, solid. That was coming out of barn, and I did it three times after that, out of the gooseneck. You know, so um, arms, collarbones, uh <laughs> I'm up to now, what is it now, bloody five, this one, four, this one now. Uh, and that was only a few years ago on bloody pit bikes. Yeah. That It was bloody collarbone smashed to pieces, punctured lung and two ribs. I remember Le Leon that, saying that, that was pit biking. Last time I had Leon on the podcast, he was talking about going pit biking with you and the, <laughs> like even when, when uh, Johnny and all, everyone's there, same with the little CB500s oh, at the school. Yeah. He said N none of them can beat you even now. <laughs> no, the little 500 bikes at the school was good because I think mainly I, I've got that much mileage on them because I was there at the school every time. Yeah. They'd just come every so often or whatever. So I'd got a lot of mileage on what, what needed to be to get a lap time. So I've really wanted to come out with me i thought come on you know i, know. I don't want to go on the big bikes i know you'll 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 really made of me as well let's go on these little ones you know which was good fun that one <laughs> yeah, class. Yeah. and also it's one of them things when we do the podcast we always end up chatting like as we're setting up and it's almost like you, ha you have to like pause the conversation so that you don't have to repeat but we got talking about one of your planes and i said have you had any close and as you start talking i said stop stop you can just tell us on the podcast so yeah any close uh, calls in the plane we did early on uh obviously me and leon's got you know licenses for it now and all that stuff um but obviously because we're bikers and that we tend to 
probably think we're better than we are. <laughs> like, uh, and uh, <laughs> over, we got overconfidence. We got, yes, overconfidence. I think that that's what you could say. Uh, and we got we got actually stuck in uh, Clad. Uh, we're trying to go down to a sponsor down north, and uh, we got stuck in Clad. We shouldn't have done. That was our fault, you know. Uh, and once you're in cloud, you didn't realise you get you know disorientated. You don't know where you are. Basically, uh, we finished up. Um, you know, I didn't. Uh, I'd ended out to sea, so I didn't, it it ended because I didn't know how far the cloud went down. I didn't know if it were cloud into fog. So we're trying to land at this airfield, and you know, I thought, well, you know, we've got to get through this stuff. Tried to get through it, couldn't get through it, and then finished up. We completely lost it. You know, like didn't know where we were. I finished up heading at the floor and Leon's there outside of me. Um, we've got a uh, sky demon, you know, that's like a sat nav, tells you your height and all the other stuff and what have you. He's shouting to me the height and we ended up now heading at the floor at like 140 mile an hour. We don't know which way we're pointing. We had a clue and I'm starting to pull upwards. It's going faster. So what had happened is it's gone inside loop. We didn't know. <laughs> you know, like, so I'm pulling up and it starts to build faster then. And he's shouting now, and he got right down to like 500 feet off, off the sea. And I finished about to pull, you know, because you know, if I had to pull that hard and that quick. But you've got to watch, you don't snap your plane because, you you know, the plane's as uh, stressed to a certain level. You know, the G-force on that is 6G. Well, I, just, I pulled it because I had to, we were either in the sea or, or pull out of it. We pulled out of it and uh, you couldn't believe it. But we in fog, fog, not cloud. It was actually fog. Um, and now trying to get out of this fog, trying to hold the wings level and all that, it took us twenty five minutes. And he was shouting as shouting to me the direction from the from the sat nav basically, you know, Sky Demon. And all I was trying to do is work out is the wings level, you know, because I've got no instruments for it. And uh, all I kept doing on that is I kept pulling up. If it slowed down, I know I'm level. If it speeded up, I must have a wing low. So then I went right, pulled. If it went faster, I've gone the wrong way. So I had to go other way, pull up. Um, oh, the shape we do, it took us 25 minutes to go out of it. I'm not joking. Once we go out of it, you know, like he was shouting everything right, left and all that stuff. So we got we got out of it, um, but we were closed. But when we popped out the actual fog, cloud, whatever it is, none of us says anything. We're just quiet. We just, <laughs> we, we just went, oh, landed it and went, oh, shit. You know, that was stupid. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. You know, and uh, that's a big Don't lesson learned. Don't tell uh, your mum. No, no. <laughs> God, that was close. But at one stage, we was going 140 straight at the floor. And oh. as I say, oh, you don't yeah. see anything. And uh, I pulled up and it went faster. Literally, just like, pull up and go faster. It should go slower. But then when we looked at the actual data, it had actually turned over and done an inside loop. So as I pulled up, it swooped under. Yeah. <laughs> never <Nice>. again <laughs> so yeah. now it's not a it's a yes it put me a lot of respect <laughs> for yeah. it yeah so if anyone asks if uh, have you ever done loop to loop not on purpose no <laughs> that's it yeah so oh, no it was uh, yeah that was I would say yes we got out of it bit of luck I think more than, more than anything and yeah. I think we know that you know like, I think we know that it was a bit normally when you go out of stuff that's real dangerous you get out of it because you go out of it on your own. You know, you go out. You know, you can go out of it. That was unknown. <laughs> you know, like, it was like a wow. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. Out of all the rural races you've done, all the Grand Prix, everything is that your biggest near miss? Yes, it's got to be because I was 100%, about to say hundred percent biggest near miss for sure. Uh, and it's more after when you realise what had happened. Even then, you go. Wow, that was close. At the time, you just it's just happening, and you're trying to get out of it. So you're not really thinking that much on that point of of that of not being wanting of dying. You know, you're just thinking get out of it. You know, and then once we go out of it and got home, it's like, wow, that was close. Have you, ever, <laughs> you know, like, have you ever been close to when you're coming along and you can see a plane coming the other way and you've got to swerve out the way? I've had uh, it was at Manchester Airport. I had a bloody uh, great big. I think it was 747 or something, come, come out of the clouds as I was going across the top of the clouds. I could see the ground because I'm on visu what you call visual and I could see holes in the clouds. Um, and I walked in his airspace, but he just popped out of the clouds and that was close. I could see the passengers in it. So it was close. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. And I weren't in the wrong at that point. You know, like, yeah, where the other one going in, you know, going into that fog, I should have knew better. This one, I didn't. I just popped out. But, yeah, whatever. Wow. Yeah. How long does it take to like like is it uh, like organize a flight? 
Can you can you just no. get out of this studio, get in that and fly? Yes. Uh, you've got rules that you have to you know, abide by. Here it's two and a half thousand feet above me. I'm not allowed in because I'm in East Midlands airspace. Um, so there's rules that you're not allowed in. But as far as jumping in it and going anywhere you want, no. That's mental. No, you can just go where you want, really, which is great. So do you do like, uh, if you f- do you know some people like jump on a bike just for a blast on a Sunday, do you something, just go for a fly just for something to do sort of thing? Me and, me and Anne, we tend to go, uh, Matlock's really nice, so, you know, peak disc and all that stuff. We mostly would go there and just, we just as slow as it can fly, um, you know, 2,000 feet, and we just float around, you know, That's tea incredible. time, you know, like, and it's what's good about it, because I can fly straight out of my farm, my field, uh, you sort of AUT and we just say, Oh, should we go for a flight? And it's like, we next 10 minutes you're in the air. You know, wow. That is so incredible, it's, it's fantastic. Do you, some yeah. t- do you know, um, when you think back to your upbringing and like your early years as a as a teenager, do you sometimes like pinch yourself at what uh, the life that you've sort of got now? And that I never ever thought I would fly a plane, never. I didn't think it was in my capabilities, to be honest, you know. Uh, or whatever. You know, I just thought it's not. You know, for me to actually get in a plane and fly it, it's for me, it's incredible. You know, like it's, it's it's a fantastic thing for me. Yes, I've done all my bike racing and all that, but you know, when you just says in my younger days, I just didn't think that was that's not me. I I can't go that far. You know, like but now it's fantastic. Yeah. Well, in your opinion, when do you think that happened? Like, when do you think I'm actually? Look what I can like. Look what I've built for the family, and like, what it, point again, did it sink in? Yeah, it's it sounds bad, and I'm sounding all but he. Oh, look at this! I've got a plane and all that stuff. But in my upbringing, I never bothered what you call the fancy cars or all like that. Um, yeah, it wasn't, didn't interest me to be honest. Bikes, fast, yeah, all great, you know. But cars never did. So anything I earned, I, I sort of put it into the farm. Just kept chugging into the farm. I want because at that point then um, I hadn't got a license, but I had bought a plane from America that you build up yourself. You know, like so. Yeah, that's such a Ron Haslam thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that was another story. That was oh, wow. I built it. It was only a, a called it MX. It's a material one, but it looks like a plane. It's got stick and all that stuff. Two stroke engine behind your head. Did you know, that, shit, and shit I, yourself the first time you went out on it. Well, I've, no, I've not done any flying at this point. I've done model flying, you know, the radio control stuff. That's what, that's what I've done. You know, that that was me. That that was me push. I want to fly. I can fly models. I want to fly. I understand thing. physics yeah. to a T yes. now. I know oh, I've got now. this. I've got it. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I bought this one from American kit form. Come in just like big long bags, uh, and you had to do everything. You had to sort of cut the holes and it put the and the wires that hold it and all this stuff. I built it all up on this littlest wreck you've ever known back behind my brother's ass. And uh, built on this little wreck, little dinky wreck, and uh, obviously so excited because I built this this you know plane, canvas plane that we built it up. And uh, but I thought I've got to run it in there. You know, so I thought I'd just run it in on this wreck. So I kept going up and down this wreck, up and down this wreck. And obviously you get faster and faster, don't you? You know, you not you know you just and it, one of the, it was that little. You sort of went from one end to the other. I had to stop, physically hush it round, and then go back the other way. You know, like that's what I was doing. And uh, you had got a railway bank one side. And uh, ass was, you know, council ass was the other side. And I'm in between them. And obviously what happened, didn't it? I got going that quick. Bloody wind got it and took it up in the air, didn't it? And I couldn't get down for the fence. So I just nailed it and went, oh, and that's it. That's my first lesson. Off I go. <laughs> you know, like, wow. And uh, at that time, I thought I'd gone high, but probably went a 1,000 feet only, you know. And I went up there and think, not a chance of getting back in that little field down there. <laughs> you know, like, I thought, wow. Where, 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 where did he go? I went to where I knew another farm had got a bigger field. <laughs> you know, I thought, I'm off in that one. You know, there's no way I can get back down to that one. It's impossible. And uh, so I'm up at like a 1,000 feet. And I thought, right, okay, let me get some practice in. So a 1,000 feet, I made out. I'm like going to land in the field, but a 1,000 foot up. So I did everything. Da, da, da. Oh, yeah, that was good. Did that about 10 times. I thought, right, okay, I'm going to go with it now. <laughs> you know, landing it. You know, it. To be fair, it went all right. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, that was my first <laughs> lesson. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So you, you did, never had lessons or anything? You nothing. just t- taught yourself? Just nothing on that. At that point, because <laughs> the plane was that uh, built and light, it was under the law to have a license. You could actually fly it. You know, like the power gliders and all that, you don't have to, you know, because it was under. So I wasn't doing it wrong. It's that one hanging up there outside. Yeah. Uh, yes, it's that one. It was actually that plane. Yeah. Wow. And uh, it was fantastic, you know. Uh, wow. And that sort of oh took me on. God. That was like a, a 45 mile an hour only, you know, like a dead basic 
kite with an engine, you know. Um, and I went from that, then obviously wanted to go further. Uh, my next one was the Eurostar, uh, which was great, you know, that fantastic plane. Wow, yeah, that's incredible. I think Thomas just got the camera in there. Yeah. Oh, I had to have a look at that. That's yes. class. Yeah. So, no, it was that was my first flying lesson on my own. Uh, and as I say, then I had to get a license, so they had to go through all the licenses of the tests and all that to get, get it through, which I enjoyed it. It was good. Yeah, but now um, <laughs> back to the racing. That's so brilliant. you said, yeah. yeah, first year you like flew through everything from like club racing yeah. to nationals to internationals. Internet, yeah. And then did you stay international for like quite some time? What it was, I was, I was with Mel Carter at the time. But he took me through everything because, again, um, it was a rogue. He'd got loads of money. He'd got, I think, a couple of garages. Um, and it was a bit dodgy on everything. So he got what I call a lot of cash <laughs> you know like uh, but, uh, yeah, you know, the tax oh, man dodged yeah, a little yeah, bit, yeah i didn't know about it and all that stuff so yeah so he, he chucked all that at me at me uh, which was fantastic um yeah straight through to international and then i started getting some success uh international you got your sort of barry sheens some americans coming over for the and it were different in them times because uh, international was like not a championship it was a one-off race you know like donnington cadwell whatever just paid to have the event uh, and you got start money you know uh, prize money and all that stuff and that's where your money come from from the event uh, so like Barry Sheen would get probably you know 20 grand for doing one meeting you know and that were a lot in them days shit I was like now. yeah yeah we're out I were like on a hour on like five grand you know which but that went to Mal because Mal not just me in terms of uh, like you know, average wage right now, I think in the UK, is, is it about 30 grand, yeah. 25, 30 yeah, grand yeah. a year, something like yeah. that? What, just to give some context, what would an average salary have been in those days? To be fair, until you, it's very hard to make any money now, uh, in the early days. Yeah. But the early, early days, I, I was lucky I got Mal Carter behind me. Oh, sorry, I, I meant... Um, so like in in normal life, like in yeah. the rest of it. So the average wage in 2022 is I think about 25 grand. Yeah. Um, just to give some context, if the prize, <sighs> if you were getting like say five grand start yeah. money or whatever, what in those days, what would have average wage be? Average wage for oh, half of what you've just said. So, you know, you know, like half, to, so yeah. you were almost getting half the average wage. Yeah. For, yes, for like about a half of it, yeah. Wow. yeah. Um, but what you've got to realise is Mal Card put all the money up. So basically the rule was um, he used, first off he paid for everything and we weren't making any money. So he paid for everything. All I've got to do is get me sent at meetings. You know, uh, I had to put the petrol in the van and get me to the meetings and back. That, that was my bill you know uh which was odd at the time as i say you know when you start talking about doll like nine ten quid, quid, <laughs> quid you know for a week you know it was like a bit weird you know but yeah good and job. then you have to pay your man good job know. good job fuel prices weren't what they are now God, yeah so <laughs> no it, it it was it was odd then but as i say how we worked once we started making a bit of money um he had two thirds i had a third or whatever come in you know and then at near the end when i was making what we'd say at that for that time, more money, we went 50 50. You know, um, and he took me right through everything. And then on the Britain picked me up, uh, the factory, you know, on the, on the factory type for England. And I rode both bikes, I rode for on the Britain plus Mal Carter. So I was riding on the and Yamaha, you know, which is unknown now. You know, like, did that take some persuading to do that, or were they quite, yeah, don't worry about it? I think it. what it was, um, the biggest thing was, uh, we went to Silverstone GP. And it was the one that uh, Barry Sheen had the big thing with Roberts when he put two fingers, fingers to him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was that meeting, yeah. And they put a support race on what they call a Formula One. That was a thousand cc four stroke. It was a support race to it. And uh, on the Britain, that's what I was riding on the Britain with. And uh, that was my first ride from. They said, Do you want to try our bike? So that's my first ride for on the Britain. They said, You know, try to see what you think. So I've been riding for Mel Carter. And I jumped on it for that meeting and uh, I won it easy, you know, because the bike was mint, you know, like really nice factory bike, you know. I won it easy and I even lapped faster than what Roberts and Sheen lapped up, you know, oh. on it. On a Formula probably, One. Probably sheer luck of stopping on, I don't know. But, you know, and that then just nailed me for a contract behind the They just went, need you. And they, they even accepted the following year me running a Yamaha and them. Uh, but then the year after that, they wouldn't accept the Amara. They just said, no, 
people want you on your own, you know, like so it sort of progressed that way. And was that in the equivalent of what Moor GP is now? Would we ride in for Honda? It was, yeah, for Honda, it was England though, you know, so it was Honda Britain, you know, so the English side of it. It's a bit like um, um, the British Championship now, you right. know, and, and Honda's in it, you know, it was that that level, so it wasn't. Uh, GP level right. at mm. that point. So like BSB know. and T yeah, BSB stuff. It was yeah. That did it include the Isle of Man TT as well? Yes. Um, the Isle of Man TT was actually a, a world championship round. Yeah. When I was in it, because um, I'm, I'll, yeah, I was lucky. I, I've uh, I got three championships, world championships, Formula One twice, and Formula Three once, and it was Isle of Man was included in that. And to be honest, you had to do it because. If you didn't do the Isle of Man, that's what you know the factories wanted basically, because that was the big pull. Yeah. So, but I, I like the Isle of Man, and Mal Carter liked it as well. So we we did a lot with it. Yeah. What was the initial thought about going to the Isle of Man? You know, it's a bit like you have to. Was it? Yeah. Yeah, you had to do it. Then, so it was really at the beginning. I really enjoyed it because yeah. they let me go on the basis as we don't want you to do anything. That this is even under and Mal. He just look, don't do anything. You know, just go there. Ride round, enjoy yourself. We'll come back home. That's it. He said, "We're not bothered about anything," and that went for three year. That did. I went three year just going, and it was just basically not thinking. I'm going to win. I'm going to do this. Nothing. Nobody expected anything on me. It was great. Then after the third year, I got to know the circuit really well, mm. and I did win one. I won, I won the won the, the Formula One, and uh, from then on, I put pressure on myself. When I went, I went to win. Which that then it you lose your enjoyment a little bit then you know like because you know somebody goes quick next time out I'll go quicker mm -hmm. you know it's, and it's that type of thing that you do and that gets you a bit of pressure building so it won't there was nobody putting pressure on me except for me mm -hmm. you know, know, like, in terms of uh, like leathers helmet um, there's a lot lots of sort of safety things like we've got um, helicopters that can land next to the track and uh, flying marshal. There's lots of safety things being put in, but obviously back then the bikes were uh, a little slower. Yeah. In terms of uh, like uh, f the fatality level, was it more dangerous or less dangerous back then? I'd say it's a little bit more dangerous now, uh, purely what you've just said. The performance in every way, whether it's tyres, bikes, brakes, the performance has gone up that much. Uh, the speed's gone up so much. And if you start talking about the Isle of Man, you've got to do it. You only you only want to do it if you want to do it, uh, because it's it's too big a risk otherwise. You know, you don't you don't do it because you know you want to get a ride of something now. You do it because mm -hmm. you want to do it, uh, so, and that's 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 your choice. You when know? when you were doing it, was it was it like quite rare for there to be a fatality, or was it? A, do you know like was it? it was, a, a, yeah, there was still some. Yeah, there was like, but not as many, nowhere near what they are now. Um, as I say, that's an I, interesting point, isn't it? Because yeah. more, more, like most things get yeah. tend to get safer as the years go on. Yeah, um, yeah, but that didn't because the Isle of Man is a different world. You know, um, well, I won my last race there to 140 mile an hour. They're doing 130 something now mile an hour. Mm. You know, it's like ridiculous, isn't it? Yeah. Dom, you're like, Dom races the TT. Dom's, uh, Dom's stuck on 129.6. Yeah, yeah. Well, I won so my that. last one. At, I think it was 114. Wow. And yeah, and a story to go to that. This is how bikes developed. Yeah. So I won my last one about 140 and I won the race. Yeah, that perfect. Um, and then obviously I went to GPs and all that stuff. So I went that, that direction. And then Onda asked me to do a, a pillion lap uh, like years and years later uh, on a fire blade. They said, can we do a pillion lap? So what we're doing, we're doing a raffle all week uh, and whoever wins the raffle gets the pillion ride on the back of you with the roads closed, you know. So you're the one riding the bike at this point, yeah? So I'm, I'm going to ride, I'm going to, yeah. So they've asked me to come back, from, you know, yeah. and, and do the pillion lap front with them. And uh, so I, you've got to realise now, I did 114 on a full-blown, you know, super bike, you know, slicks, everything and all that. I got on this pillion bike, bog standard, brand new tyres, not a mile on the bike, you know, on the, just got it off the showroom, aren't they? Uh, all on the grid. Whoever won, it was actually a sidecar passenger, a girl, little, littlest girl you've ever seen, sidecar passenger. Jumped on it, set off down Bray Hill, off we went. Uh, I got halfway around, I, God, closest I ever come to crashing. <laughs> really? <laughs> Jesus. And this girl, I'm not young, she's a sidecar passenger. She hadn't got a nerve in her body, you know, like she just, thought everything was 
perfect, you know. And I got halfway around and I went over one of the risers and this thing went into the biggest tank slapper you've ever known. And I went cab to cab, flat stick, six gear, you know. And it was like, a bit of luck, wide into the cab, backed it down a little bit, but then carried on over the mountain and all that stuff. And uh, <laughs> cutting it short, we pulled into the pits anyway, you know, uh, you know, and the cameras were all there and the microphone that, you know, goes around all the TT and everything. And... Uh, as soon as they come in, they flip the visor up, uh, and what do you think to that? I hope you don't mind me swearing, but you this, crack on. <laughs> she, she, so they picked the visor up, and she went straight in with Michael, and, and says, "What do you think to that?" She went, "Fucking hell!" <laughs> and I went all the way around the Isle of Man, all on the speakers and everything. <laughs> you know, like, because we got this big tank slap, and we got all the mountain section. She thought that were normal. <laughs> you know, like I thought, wow, you don't realise how close that was. You know. <laughs> And, uh, oh, it was, it was fantastic. And to cut it, you're a standard start and uh, a stop just the after the pits on a standard bike, road go. ties, everything, 110. Wow. I, I won it at 114. I've got a bog standard road bike with somebody on the back, but brakes not even better than Cruising. <laughs> yeah. Brakes, you know, the performance of the bike has come up so much, speed and yeah. everything. You know, oh, that's like, crazy. Yeah. Uh, another memory just popped in my head <laughs> from the uh, when I used to go to Donington to watch the GPs, and uh, you used to do the pillion laps. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I once seen you with Prince Harry in the wet. It was Prince Harry, wasn't it? Yes. And you came out of uh, the old hairpin, like literally, yeah. like spinning sideways, yeah. wheeling like that. Yeah. Oh, fantastic! You know, folks don't realise how quick you know the bikes can go around the circuit and. You know, you get all the road lads and all this. And I really used to enjoy it that, you know, you get road lads that first they do, they buy a bike, super bike, whatever, for the road, you know, a road version of it. And first thing they do is they put old in suspension on it or they change the brakes and all that. We, our bikes were bog standard as they come. And you get them on the back and you show them what performance they can do on the bike. And it absolutely, you know, transforms them. They go, I can't believe it can do that good much. But it's on a track, you know, which you know is a lot better. You know, do you know when you were in your school, did you ever have uh, p people coming in, like giving it the big end and things, and then just say, oh, jump on the back, I'll take you for a lap, just scare them shitless? I've done that a few times, <laughs> I mean, yes. Uh, and that's purely like the, you know, mainly when they've says there's something wrong with the bike. <laughs> you know, like they've says, oh, yeah, the bike's, you know, the tyres we use, I used to use road tyres um, because we didn't use to change the tyres for wet or dry. So I picked a road tyre that did both, basically. Mm. So it wasn't the good performance in the dry, but it would cope in the wet. So it, in other words, it spun up easy and everything. So it made it even feel better. <laughs> you know, like, And uh, as soon as you got on, like, oh, these tyres aren't very good. It's doing this, it's doing that. And um, if they're complaining a lot, I'd say, well, okay, just for sake, I says, jump on back of me. You know, I said, you know, I'll give you a few laps. And it was just really as a... Um, like, you know, you're not very happy with the day. Let me see if I can make you happier, you know. And when they come in, then they just didn't say, oh, they just went, wow. I didn't realise it we could do that. You know, the power, the acceleration, the braking. And and the big one that you, they don't know about, uh, I, I always had a handle on the tank from. So they put the arms around me, grabbed the handle, you know, a bit more secure from, you know. But even then, the braking are that powerful. You braking as hard as you can. They actually slide up your back and start pivoting over your head, you know, because that is that or that. But what what they don't realise, because yeah, because their body weight holding an handle low down, they pivot, they pivot up, and I can get them right on top of my helmet. But they don't know I'm actually controlling that with a brake. So I'm getting them. And they think they're going over. <laughs> you know, like they think they're coming <laughs> over my head. You know, like and and they start, and soon they start getting a bit too. I just let the brake off a bit more. You know, like that. And oh god, you know. And they come in. I'm not joking. The knuckles are white. <laughs> you know, like, where, where they've been hanging on. <laughs> you know, it, it's great. Yeah. Do you miss the school days? I do really. Yeah. Yeah. It was good. Um, again, the COVID hit, uh, which it on the factory uh, quite heavy. So it made it so we couldn't get the bikes off the under either. So we had to we had to pack up. I must ask you: you taking a part of the monarch around the track? You know what? How much like what was your briefing like? Don't kill <laughs> part of the royal family. You know what? What, what was what was the briefing like? Or was it? Relaxed? Oh, it was. Yeah. To be fair, we did go a bit gentler with him. But again, <laughs> you know, but yeah, yeah, but not a lot. <laughs> you know, like because it's the thrill of like them getting the buzz of of like wow it can do all this you know and to be fair even when you're getting them to come over your head or you know even you get some young lads they think they're helping you out so what they do you're coming into redgate 
they'll sort of hang out before you're there. And that cocks you up because it mucks you up and it, you know, and, that, and they keep doing it. So to stop them doing it, what you do is, as soon as they hang out, touch the brakes, they fly around the front straight away because they can't hang on, can they? You can swing your leg out and hook them and catch them and then push them back on again. They stop doing it then. They don't hang out there. And you think, oh, that's it. That, I want you to stop there. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. you know, I, stuff if, like that. If I ever see you outside yeah. of a pub and say, do you want to lift home? Yeah. There is no way I'm getting on the back of a bike with oh, you. Not a, not a nice hope. <laughs> nice, no, good. Um, so uh, back to back to racing day. So yeah. you've got a little bit of the TT. Overall of yeah. the time at the TT, you mentioned you won the F1 race. Won the F1. Um, it was a Formula 3, but... To be fair, um, it was another uh, shop that actually made you know made the bike. It was on the Formula Three bike, a uh, little four hundred it was. And uh, to be fair, that championship I can class it as a championship. You know, we won a world championship on it. But the bike was so fast compared to everybody else's. Um, it it was easy one. You know, like, you know, like when you get when you know it's like. I'm actually on a better bike than everybody else here. <laughs> you know, like, and, and I was capable of riding the Isle of Man as well. You know, like, so it was like a bit of both put together. It was a, mm-hmm. as long as the bike don't break, I was going to win it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. When you were in uh, Honda Britain, who were your teammates at the time? I've had quite a few. Um, Joey Dunlop, he was one of the best ones. I knew Joey really well. Um, come to the house, went to his house a lot. Um, so, yeah, Joey was a fantastic one. Um, Alex George, he was another TT runner. Um, Wayne Gardner, um, yeah, he moved on with us into the um, into the GPs and stuff. Um, Roger Marshall, you know, I don't know if you know the names, but, you know. Uh, yeah. Oh, we know Roger. all these. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. had Roger Marshall on the podcast. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, all, all them, uh, quite quite a few, you know. Um, what, were, what were your fondest memories of Joy? I think his way of life, how he, you know, did the way of life. He was like, you know, he just did what he wanted, and you know, and and that was it. He was happy with everything. And again, he he was one that didn't want fancy cars or all like that. He was just happy with what he did, you know, like, uh, and that's what I liked about him. And his family were the same, you know. Um, all the family was good, you know. Um, their family was a bit like our family. You know, it was, uh, you could walk in his ass and me send a cup of tea without asking anybody. You know, it didn't matter. You know, like it was one of them, which like my upbringing related perfectly to what his upbringing was. I think that was the bit, you know, it was a person that never says much, never talked oddly at all. You could go, you could go two days and if you got two words out of him, it'd be a lot. You know, he's one of them that, you know, but it would, it would you know, he'd play on bikes or whatever. I went to his place and went to uh, Giants Causeway. We went catching crabs and in the things they were showing me how to catch crabs and stuff like that. You know the big things and put your hand underneath and like find where they are gently so they don't get you. Then pull this great big frigging crab out. You know, God, that frightened shit out me. That did. <laughs> you know, like, well, yeah, it was. Yeah, you know, it, it was good. And they're like jumping from rocks to rocks and stuff. What you call fun, but you know, just normal. You mm-hmm. know, yeah. And it's all class. Yeah, yeah, it was good. And. um Back then, so back then, explain what the do you know like the equivalent of British Superbikes is now. Was the was it like an ACU sort of championship? Yeah, um, you got um, you got the Formula One championship that took you all all around the England stuff plus Ass and you know the same job really. Yeah, uh, but uh, the main one was what uh, Formula One, uh, which was thousand cc. You know uh, that was the main class, the Superbike class. It was actually slightly lower. You know, because uh, the factories wanted the you know the thousand cc four strokes yeah. uh, there, so that was the you know that was the main class for it. Um, yeah, it's pretty similar, um, similar, but I would say a bit more. How uh, can I say it? A bit more freedom. You know, like you know you you could get somebody on a privateer bike. You know that would actually have a chance of winning. You know and, and stuff. You know even though the Ondas were really good as factory bikes. Um, so yeah, a bit more you know you know a bit more flex. But it's like when I first started the GPs, you'd go to Spa and there'd be 50, 60 riders. You had to qualify, and if you didn't qualify, you went home. All right, <laughs> you know like that was the MotoGP. You know like yeah. Uh, so you went to Spa and and you had to get into so many, so many got through automatically. They were in the championship, and then everybody else had to qualify. Not right. <laughs> what, what was the first year you went to? Like what's MotoGP? Uh, MotoGP. Um, I went from Honda Britain um, straight 
uh, straight into Japan, on the Japan, uh, which is the you know uh, the GP side of it. Um, so you got to realize them Honda and Honda is two separate things altogether. Honda Britain is one unit. Japan is a completely different. You know, um, so I went with them um, as uh, I went straight in as Mal look, won't it? Straight in and my teammate Freddie Spencer. <laughs> Nobody could beat him. So, like, you know, it's like normal, isn't it? Always. You There's fit. the bar. Yeah. So, you, your first task in life, in racing, is beat your teammate. You're not bothered about anybody else. Beat your teammate because he's on the same bike as you. It's in the same team. So, that's the target. Beat your teammate. <laughs> Who do I get? Freddie Spencer that nobody can beat. Oh, shit. You know, like, but uh, it was good because it was good. Good mileage, you know, good mileage and seeing, you know, how he did it and what he did. Do you, are you still mates with Freddie now? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, good mates still. Yeah, he come to the school a few times um, and see, he even a school in, uh, in America. I was a, did he have something in France or I think there's somebody He else. tried to do a bit in France as well, but his main one was in America, but it was a different type of school. His was more um, smaller, related to superbike, you right. know, not road bike, mm. um, where mine was more related to a road bike so all the road lads can have a go at it you know so that that was my area so yeah so he was uh smaller groups more super bike type stuff what you know? what is sorry for remember, uh what age were you then when you like first became teammates with Freddie spencer then uh god what would i be then i won't be that old um middle 20s i think then like that. oh, yeah that's a middle f- 20s yeah Ah, it's a fast yeah. accelerator. So what age were you when you first got on the tarmac and you nicked your brother's bike and went around Cadwell? The first one was <coughs> Cadwell Park and it was on a, a Gus Gun Commando I was on. Uh, and my brothers, that they made into a, you know, a, a open class one. Mm. You know, instead of production, it was open class. Uh, and I had to go on that one at Cadwell Park. Um, but, oh, God, push starts. But he, you know, uh, 750 Norton, trying to push start it now, 15. You know, not very big either, you know. And bump starting one of them things, you know, because there's no keys or starter mode or all like that. You had to pull it back on compression. And the only way I could do it is run as fast as I could run till, till you run that fast, you start going slower because, you, you know, your legs don't keep up. Jump as high as you can, hit the seat as hard as you can and time the clutch to go in and out because you couldn't leave it out or it would just lock the wheel. And if you missed it, that it, start again. <laughs> go off pull it back, you know. So you always had to make sure that it spun over. So the big one was run as fast as I could in it, jump as high as you could, hit the seat as hard as I could because I won't very heavy to get to turn over, but then the clutch had to go in out. You couldn't go out, fire, go, no. In out, you just had to flick it over, <laughs> like a flick start, basically. Um, I think that helped me in the GPs to finish it when the push starts. Uh, I got most of, mostly faced away. I had to add it hard early on, and so the GPs were dead easy. Two stroke, you know, didn't you didn't need hope for that, you know, like so yeah, so it worked well. So you've gone from fifteen year old, yeah, twenty year old in your twenties, yeah, in the twenties, yeah. Looking yeah, at Freddie Spencer, is, going, yes. I've got to beat you, son. God, yes, I know. That progression is, it was horrendous, you know. Uh, again, I, I didn't really look at it that way. I looked at it. This is where I am. This is where I want to be. I want to now progress forward. You know. But again, it's dead hard. Freddie Spencer was your teammate, you know, and it wasn't just me. Everybody in the paddock wanted to know how we were doing it. Um, at that time, two two fifty two strokes. The two fifty lads, uh, Tony Mang and and uh, Sarons and all them, they used to laugh at us on five hundreds. Well, it can't be a very strong class, you know. Uh, if somebody like that can just clear off and win everything, all oh, others can't be very good, you know. Like that's mm. you know that's what they were saying. Perfect. He actually did both classes, didn't he, Freddie? Won both. Absolutely did exactly the same in the 250. Yeah. Brilliant. <laughs> so it was like, right, that shows you what we're up against. <laughs> you know, they were fantastic. I think it was just like a natural talent. Like not... It was natural talent for him, yeah. Uh, he got so much natural talent and so much self-belief, you know. Um, he do stuff on bikes that, you know, you, you don't even think you could do. You know, like his biggest one that I know he gained the most out of is the front end braking, you know. He could actually leave black lines off the front wheel all the way to the corner. He could turn it under with a brake on, slowing it. You know, like 
I tried it. <laughs> Crashed. <laughs> You're like, yeah. You know, he had so much feeling and, and you know, and skill or whatever you want to call it, you know. Um, and it was incredible. And the only reason I know that, I went to a test day in Brazil with him and there were only me and him on the, I had the old track. And uh, the track was actually a bit dusty. And as we got about half a day finished, I could, you know, the dust was leaving lines. And I could see these black lines going into the corners. And I thought, well, it's very thin and it's going all the way up to the apex. It can't be the back wheel. I need the front wheel off him, won't it? It's obvious then. I, it was perfect because all I had to do was try and copy it. <laughs> nah. Ed butted the floor. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, so it was like, it was got so much skill there. Yeah. Did you have some good times uh, being teammates like off track? And he, Freddie was a bit Joey Dunlop, kept himself to himself in the motor home. He was, uh, it wasn't that he was um, awkward or whatever. I would just say he was shy or whatever you want to say. He just, you know, he didn't interact very much. Um, when he was, his uh, mechanic was uh, AF Kenimoto. And that's all. That's the only person he used to talk to. He used to come out his motor home, mostly with his helmet on, sit in the corner of the garage. Uh, AF Kenimoto would go to him, talk to him, he'd get on his bike, mm. do three or four laps, come in, sit in the corner, AF would go to him. Uh, and then he'd either go out again or he'd walk back to his motor home. That's it. And it was like there was not much interaction with anything there on that side. But I don't think that was his choice. I think that was just what he was. Who was who was the most fun, kind of off track? Who was uh, the most mental? Mental? <laughs> oh God, there were a lot of them. I would say the most, yeah, mental one, it, it, Randy Mamola. You know, he would, stuff that he'd go up to was incredible. Go on, give know. us a cheeky story. Give us a cheeky one. Simple one on what I was involved in anyway. Um, <laughs> America, um, Daytona, Daytona, America. Big first thing you do in, in America, you go and get your eye the biggest car you've ever known, don't you? Because these big American cars, don't you? Big automatic American car. So we all went and got one of these, and we we on that. And I'm sitting at traffic lights, yeah, all on red, double lane, car outside of me. Then I'm sitting there. Next minute, I'm being pushed through the lights. Randy's behind me in a big American car, butted up to me. And he's got smoke pulling off it, pushing me through lights. I've got the brakes on. I finished up, slammed it in reverse, trying to push him back. It's pushing me into middle, through lights. And I'm like, like that. there's a bloke, normal bloke in his normal car sitting at side going like, what the hell's going off here? You know, so I've got my wheels spinning as hard as I could. Big American car. Like, he's gone pushing me that way. And oh, Jesus Christ, you know. <laughs> and that was Randy. He just didn't matter to him you know um <laughs> it, it, it was crazy what, yeah. what was he like on track just as crazy or it was yeah yeah it was it was very skillful and he had he had i'd say more more odd look than me um he was so close to winning the championship that many times he got the second place so many times he could have won it as easy as, as easy as he lost it you know would you say randy's the probably the best rider to never win yes yeah he got the closest ever ever to you know he, he should have won one yeah he you know, should have won it it just whatever happened it didn't but you who, know, he should have done which other riders in history do you think have been like the nearly ones like who's who's the other best riders that have never been world champion i know um randy comes straight to mind because i just know how big an effort he put in and all that stuff did danny pedroza ever win Danny, I don't think Danny did either, no. He's, he's another no, one that's probably He's another close. one, yeah. yeah. So I'd say Jesus probably him and Danny. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's quite a few that got right close, but yeah. didn't, didn't quite do it. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Uh, and then you get your other ones, like, I'm, I shouldn't say, you know, you, Kevin Schwantz, he got all the luck with, luck with him and he won straight away. And you're like, great. Which that could have been Randy, it could have been, you know, Petrosa. Mm -hmm. If they'd just gone that little bit more from it, they'd have done it. It's also yeah. mad how back then it was kind of dominated by the Americans. And then it, there's been a bit of an American dra drought for a while. I know they've got a few, like Joe Roberts is coming through and they've got, uh, is it Bobier or Cameron yes. Bobier? Yeah. Them two are both in Moto 2. But yeah. it, even after the, that sort of era, that had Ben Spees, but, Nicky Hayden. But then there's been yeah. this sort of I was about to say, it was Nicky Hayden in GP, wasn't it? And, yeah. But then Ben Spees' worlds, he dominated worlds, didn't he? But he then did. he... He got into MotoGP, he got a chance, mm, didn't he? He did, yeah. How did he fare in that? I can't mind on. No, but he, he didn't. No. He didn't fare there. We are. No, no, he didn't, that. No, he didn't. That was a bad bit. Um, 
whatever reason why and, and you never know what the reason is you mm-hmm. know was whether he's not happy with the team or the bike or whatever this summer wasn't Le- you know leon would happy. have been in world superbikes when ben yes ben started it was ben's mm-hmm. first because ben and um johnny ray started on the same year and yeah ben, did yeah ben speed won yeah. the championship in his first yes, year he did it's crazy when you think about yeah. it but then he never oh. never seen never sort of cut it at motor gp level no he didn't uh, i mean he was good he was fast but he just what against the competition and like yeah. Alexa rossi and stuff he never saw sort of i think up. what happened there as you say i think the luck run his way good rider fast rider and he just got a bit of luck to go his way where instead of falling off he saved it and won it mm. you know like it was you know a little bit of that but then when you get i'd say more riders in that you know as strong as that mm. When he pushes to get in front of them, he has to push that many more times. So lower averages is not going to happen. You yeah. know, like you know, so he's having to go beyond what you know where he's done for his mileage or whatever he's done. Like mm-hmm. where that first year in there, he probably had to, only had to push a few times over his limit, and he, he got away with it. Yeah. So he won the championship. As I say, Randy could have done that, but it just he probably did the opposite. He pushed to win the championship, but he probably fell off and lost the points. Mm-hmm. You know? yeah. Do you know um, at what point in your career did you have Leon? Um, yeah, good one. Right, um, still in MotoGP because they come all everywhere with me. Uh, uh, me and Andy, uh, me and his uh, mum, because um, all I can remember on that is where you know we used to take him on the plane, and uh, basically it was simple. Uh, we just once we're on the plane again, how I used to work that because again money money won't me aim, and I, I suppose I didn't get that that well paid what I should have done because I never had no managers. I just you know just accepted what were happening. Um, so I, I was with Honda. And Honda always used to pay first, uh, first class or business class, you know, one or the other. And straight away I said to them, I said, do you mind if I just change the ticket from business down to economy? And if I can do that, but the money, I can have them bring my wife and Leon, you know, where it costing me, you know. So I always did that. I just changed my ticket. The money that I saved from that uh, got all three of us there. So we went economy everywhere. And straight away, little tight seats. Leon's there. You ain't got a seat because we were too, too little. And as soon as the plane took off, all we did, we chucked him on the floor. <laughs> chucked him on the floor, chucked a coat of him because they wouldn't allow it, you see. Chucked a coat so they couldn't see him and it was that way. And he went, he did that. Every time meet, he cried, every just time. kept shut up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and in the motorhome, we used to just drive all ourselves, you know, drive to each meeting, um, three of us, you know, just, just drive there. We, from one to the other we used to go to. So we, we weren't in a big panic. So when you know, if there were a couple of weekends off, if it was a couple of thousand mile, we'd just take more days to do it in, you know, just travel. Yeah, yeah. but you've had some mega times. Yeah. You know, when Liam was growing up, did you just think, right, I'm going to get him in the racing? Or what was your attitude? Just like, let's just see what happens. I tried to not get him into it, to be honest. Uh, right? Yeah, the reason of it is I was in a panic situation where I don't want him to do it because his dad does it you know like cause it's normal you know the kids always want to do what their dads do if they you know on that side of it and i was i was petrified of that happening because i thought if he goes into it because i'm doing it he's going to do nothing you know because he's not doing it for himself you know hmm. so i really i really made it hard for him to be honest um i never pushed bikes at him at all he had to go on a paddock bike not about it um and yeah, his first ever bike was it was four and a half year old, and Granby Motors, a local shop, um, uh, get him one as a if they put the name on it. Cause I'll go around all the paddocks, you see. So they get him in this little peewee, you know, and that was his first ever bike, you know. So he got sponsored for his first ever bike. Leon did, you know. <laughs> now that's factory, yeah, isn't it? Let's yeah, face it. Yeah. So like, wow. Um, and he just played about with it and all that stuff. He wasn't that interested. But then he go into motocross, you know, he, and that come about where. I never, never encouraged him at all. And he just says one day, he just says, uh, why aren't I racing, Dad? Why aren't I doing motocross? Because I'd got a motocross team at the time, you know, with about four riders. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> what yeah. Is, is it? <laughs> right, no, so yeah. we're going to go back to that. Yeah. Right there, yeah, so we've got a motocross team. And when I say a motocross team, it's not quite right. That that was, I knew a lot of my friends and I helped them out. So we made this team. So it helped to get sponsors in. You know, yes. pull my name to it. Get this team together. Yes. So we got like four riders. There was really running the self, but 
on the basis that they can use my name and it's a team, you mm. know, that gets a bit better from, gets a bit of help, you know. Uh, and he just said one day, I think he was eight, eight year old, he just says, why die? And I got motocross dad. I said, well, you've never asked. You know, so, so I'm not bothered, you know. Well, yeah, I want to have a go. And I thought, okay, this is it. He wants to have a go, not me, you know. So then I got excited, didn't I? I thought he wants to go on bikes, you know. And uh, so what did I do straight away? I went straight out going um, 60, 65, 60, it was 60 Kawasaki motocross, a little one, you know. Uh, got a van and off we went motocrossing, you know, like, and oh, he loved it. It was, yeah, playing about just normal kid stuff, you know. Um, it lasted three weeks. Three weeks, and I'm now nah, I'm excited because I'm coming back and I'm changing the bike and I'm doing all the bits that you know like help it out, you know, lowering the seats and all that stuff. He's bringing you cars at UK. <laughs> like, yeah, any yeah. chance you can have a look at this engine? Then? <laughs> yeah, so I'm doing all that bit, and then three weeks passed, and uh, he never said that. He just went boom, dead. You know, nothing. And I thought well, I'm not going to do it. So I just left the bike all clean, ready, and all that in the van. And I just left it, and it went. It went about two weeks, and he just says, "Dad, why aren't we?" Why aren't we going on motocross? He never asked me. You know, this is eight year old. You know, you got to realize he never asked me, so I didn't bother. You know, oh yeah, I want doing that. Was the worst thing I ever done. As because I said you never asked me every day from school. <laughs> Dad, are we motocrossing? Dad, are we motocrossing? Oh Christ! And then it was just like wow. You know, he just wouldn't stop. You know, like, and that just told me that really yeah, he just wanted it. He wanted bikes. Yeah. You know? And what what was your initial assessment of the boy then? He thought, you know, his first go on the bike, you think, and the boy's got it or? Oh, God, well, the first one of the first goes, he had to go on the field, and the bloody throttle stuck wide open <laughs> for whatever reason. I'm squealing to him. He's eight year old. He's not really got much under him, you know. I'm shouting, pull, clutching, pull, clutching. Then he's heading towards fence. I'm saying, jump off, jump off, you know, like shouting at the top of my voice. This eight year old, you know, uh, he managed to get it to stop anyway, you know. But uh, and that's when you got. That's when it made me realise, wow, he could have hit himself. You know, like. Pfft. You know, like, he could hate himself. Then it was like, okay, he wants to do it, but Christ, I don't really want him to do this. It's like too much pressure. You know, did um, he, you know, after that moment, did you just see the future unfold before you? He went, this is going to be going motocross, then it's going to be tarmac, and then it's going to be this. It's going to, you I, know. I thought he was going to go motocross all the way through because hmm. he loved the jumps, the, the, the fun. You know, the fun of jumps, twisting the bike and doing all the, what they do, you know, this supercross type yeah. stuff, you know. Absolutely loved it. Didn't want to even know about the tarmac stuff at all. Um, and then we got the race school, didn't we? So we come down to the race school and I got, you know, the road bike CB500 stuff. Um, I said, oh, yeah, go on that if you want. So I jumped on back on him. You know, he's only, you're only 12, something like that. So I, I jumped on the back of him and said, right, go and set up. We off, off we went. And the uh, biggest thing I, I learned with him is, uh, is on the back to get him up to speed. I just, is that little, it's dead dinky, you know, and I'm behind him. I could physically push him where I wanted, you know, like. So I lean could, in. Yeah, I could go, all right, we're going in here, we're going in there. And then I got to find out that I could, if I ordered his arms, I could actually then push and pull his arms, you know, to show him where it needed to be, you know, and all that stuff, you know. And uh, it brought him on horrendously fast because breaking points and all that stuff, you know, it was like, you know, you know. And then I got to the point where I said, right, you know, you know what? I'll tap you when to break, you know, like, you know, and all that, you know, just to, you know, it's like, go, because he won't go deep enough, you know, like, and I uh, tap, tap, break and all that stuff. And uh, he got that into it, uh, Donington. I tapped him to break and he didn't. So then I actually then thought, shit, we're too fast. You know, this is up into McLean's. He's little. I shoved him over the handlebars and grabbed the bars, <laughs> you know, like, and uh, so, you know, we got through and round it. And he says, what rope? I says, I says but you're getting too fast. He says, no, I won't. Jesus, you know, like so in his head he walked too fast, you know, but yeah, but it was a good, good way of you know showing him around and all that stuff. You know, it was good fun. No. He were, he was piddled off with me because I shoved him and grabbed the bars. <laughs> you know, like yeah. <laughs> it's my life for playing here with son as well. No, yeah. it was yours. Yeah. And, uh, in Jonathan Ray's autobiography, he talks about the crossover from motocross to road racing. The first experience he had was coming to your school. Yeah. Um, do you have any other riders that have like you've you've Got into tarmac race and all like not got in. We've had a lot of people at the school. I mean, Jeremy Williams, he was always there. Um, wow, Johnny Ray, uh, John Reynolds, uh, Melandry, he come a lot, you know, to the school. Yeah, uh, so there's a lot of riders, you know, coming because I think the main bit was once even when there was established riders, um, they come to the school because it's a road bike. 
So you're not doing any setup, you're not doing anything, the tyres what they are, and it brought them back to racing how it was when they first started and it was fun. You know, like, we're not bothered about lap times, we're not bothered about a tyre or pressure or anything, we're just going to ride it and we're going to have fun on it, you know, and that was the school, you know, so Johnny Ray used to come love it, uh, Jeremy Williams used to come all while and just, it was a, a massive play day back to what it should be, you know, you know, not the pressure of like having to win, having to qualify, having to do this, nah, all gone, back to this normal, you know, riding a bike bit. You know, and I think that's what everybody liked. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Have you had have you had anyone at your school or come through your school and they've been a shock that they've, to be blunt, come successful, um, or been, succeeded more than what you thought they could have? There's there's a, there's a few that's done good, yes, on that. As I say, hmm. um, the Johnny Ray is the obvious. You know, we had to go at the school and he's look what he did. You know, yeah. like, but I'm not saying we did that. He would have done it anyway, but. It did come to the school and played with it and all that stuff. So it's not, I'm not taking credit for that. It's, it's built itself up, you know, for yeah. that. Um, but yeah, Melandra used to come and I, I think it was more bringing them back, riders back to reality and, and fun. You know, mm -hmm. we never, we never went to go like, let's see who can go fastest, even though that's what we did. You know, like that in a Z, <laughs> that's what we did. But it won't, you know, like it, were, it was just more fun. At, you know. at what point did you stop racing? And kind of it was that night like, Leon. Yeah. Um was there much of a time where neither like before Leon started racing properly and you'd retired? No, it? Leon's first uh first race was scooter racing. Uh he had a good skills. So I'd been doing motocross, it it uh he'd had two bad runs at motocross, two years on trot. Um first year it got the champ British championship, it got it, got to Ireland. All he's got to do is finish in, you know, the points and he'd got it. Went and fell off and broke his leg, didn't he? Quite bad frame on it and all that crap. Was that one of the pins in your yes, collection? There you is, go, yeah. you see. <laughs> yeah, so that's one of them. Yeah. Oh, and that is one of them. That's when I felt so guilty. You know, I thought, Christ, he just put all this effort in, all this practice of the thing. He's going to be a, he's going to be a British champion motocrosser here. Yeah? And it just went. You know, in other words, the failure, you know, because the last round, it broke his leg. And on top of that, it was a real bad break. You know what mm. I mean? It wasn't just a, you know, okay, put yourself in a pot and away. It was it was a serious job. We finished up. I had to get a private buddy plane, uh, ambulance plane, to uh, Nottingham General. Wow. Um, because in Ireland, the hospital that did it, they were a bit of an arse, to be honest, because they didn't agree with young lads motocrossing parents laid a motocross you know that was the surgeons and everything so there was a bit like there wasn't very happy with oh, us we're know. not doing it what, what of this. you yeah what you know why are you were letting your lad you know damage you damage him like this and all this stuff you know so they weren't very happy with it and uh but what they did it had a lot of bumps and breaks before motocross and uh that night when he'd done it he uh i'm with him you know sitting at the side of the bed on his mammies and he's saying so what's not right dad he says the pain's horrendous you don't get this much pain he says something wrong and uh i phoned uh, the surgeon i knew uh at uh, nottingham colton his name was uh the top one and he says what you can do he says just get him here he says if he's getting that much pain there shouldn't be not after the surgery what he's done and all the stuff and they put him in a pot you know um so i, I just I, I took him out of that hospital straight away, got him in a plane, flew him to East Midlands, straight from East Midlands, straight to uh, uh, Nottingham. And the surgeon were waiting there for him. And uh, basically, it's a good job he did. Because he, he says, he says if you hadn't done that, if you'd left him there at night, he'd have lost his leg. They put the pot on too tight, stopped all the blood. Never. Yeah. yeah. And he was the top surgeon. He wasn't just like, you know, it was it. Uh, it, was, um, it was the highest rank you could get. And uh, he just said, if you hadn't had him there, he said he would have definitely lost his leg. And I thought, wow, you know, like frightened me to death. Yeah. He says, he, he got him on the table, cut the pot off, cut his leg open. He says, and his muscle jumped out. It was that pressured that hard. His muscle physically jumped out his leg. He said, but then he sorted it all out, obviously, and all that. <laughs> uh, and all this, obviously, I'm I'm feeling so guilty now. You know, like going, Jesus Christ, my lad's here, but he's 12 year old. You know, like, and he's going through all this lot, you know. Um, anyway, they patched him all up and, we, and he's in Nottingham now. And uh, this is where I really, I really, uh, I don't know, felt so bad. Well, you've probably heard the story before, but because I've said it, told it a few times. I'm in there, so we're having turns. If I'm stopping him one night, 
and I'm stopping the next night in the bedroom with him. Yeah, you know, like overnight. And uh, that's about it. I'm stopping there overnight and I'm talking to him and all that. And I thought, I can't let him do this. You know, he's laying here in pain, bottom leg, you know, 12 year old. So I says to him, I said, Leon, I says, uh, to be honest, you know, he says, uh, I think we've got to pack up with motocross. And he says, what? He says, I, this, I made it up. I says, I ain't got enough money for it. I says, uh, I said, we're running out of money. I says, I says, you know, I can't do it. You know, I said, I mean, a bit. I says, we're going to need to stop. I said, also, I says, you're hating yourself too much. I says, you actually had a lot of crashes and all this stuff. I said, you're hating too much. I was trying to completely put him off, you know, it. and uh, I, he went quiet. Never said that to me. Uh, we changed over. The man, you know, and this man then stopped that next night and I come home. And uh, after Anne come back, uh, she says, uh, Leon told me to ask you something. Uh, and I said, what's that? He says, if you give him one more chance, he says he won't crash as much and we won't practice as much to save some money. That's what he says to his mum to tell me. I'm not joking. I was like, what am I doing? You know, like he wants it so much. You know, for him to say that, I thought, nah. I just dug in then. I just dug in. I thought, anything he wants, I'll do it. From then on, I just then... As much as I could help him, I helped him. Basically, I thought he's not doing it because you know he wants to do it. That's his life. You know, mm -hmm. that's the way he wants to go. You know, but I felt so bloody bad. You know, mm -hmm. me trying to put him off, and he's coming back to me saying that I won't crash as much money, I won't practice as much, and I won't crash as much if you just let me one more year. I thought, wow. <laughs> you know, like yeah. With with like Leon's racing, mm -hmm. do you have limits in your own mind? You're a TT racer. Yeah. The Cow Grand Prix, you would. Was it six out of six? Six out of six. six Macau, that is yeah. Yeah. So have you, uh, wow. Have you never raced at Macau and not won? No. <laughs> that is, that is <laughs> yeah. amazing. That, that is was, amazing. I was the first one to win on a four stroke. It was always, again, the GP two stroke lads, the, the Motor GP lads with the two strokes. And I went with Honda Britain with the four stroke uh, and I managed to beat. It was the Japanese uh, GP lads that were there, you know, and I managed to beat him. I think he would have beat me, but. I qualified in front of him and I got a better start than him and he caught me up and I can hear him going into the air and the next minute I hear that sound that you never want to hear. <laughs> Behind you, like, oh Christ. I'm going into the air and I just like that and the next minute he comes sliding past me. But if he hadn't done that, he probably might have beat me at that time. Bloody you know? hell. Yeah, but uh, no, I got six out of six. I even won on the help there. Yeah. Bloody hell. They had some great times over there. What, yeah, that was good. What was, there, what was scary in a ride? TD. Oh, the TT, no, TT. Uh, That's uh, interesting. Yeah, Macau, it's still a long circuit, but you got to know it like a short circuit. So there's nothing come as a surprise. You know, like there were no surprises to it. The TT, until I got three years under my belt, there was always summer that you wasn't sure about. You mm. know, like you, you, you'd be in a section where you know it's flat out, you know you should be hanging on to sixth gear, but your hand went the other way. You know, like it was like, mm, I know it is, but no. You know, like where... You get Macau, it's not that far around. So you know exactly what's there, what's coming, what's happening. So you can you can push a bit harder, basically. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. So, so about them limitations when it comes to Leon. He I said, I want to do the TT, Macau, I want to do Scarborough, I want to do Northwest. What's your would, thoughts on that? Yeah, he would probably have another broken leg. Right. What from you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so in other words, no. Yeah, yeah fair enough. But so the, it, the biggest I, thing on that, he doesn't actually want to do them. Yeah. Mm. He, he, in his head, it's not that, you know, I'm holding him back. He doesn't want to do them. He just says, no. He says, Isle of Man will take too long to learn. He says, and he doesn't like having to ride a little bit under, which you have to on the road circuits. You know, he, you can ride 120% on short circuits. You've got, you know, places to slide off. You've got uh, air fencing. You've got everything. There, you cannot ride 120% because the risk, not the risk, the, uh, yeah, the risk of that lap and all the things that can, you know, that's unknown would catch you. You know, you can't. So you've always got to be riding slightly under that, even though you're riding it at its strongest that you can. Yeah. Uh, because you can't go to what you call short circuit stuff. Uh, short circuit, you wouldn't last. You wouldn't last, you wouldn't last four laps. Mm. Because the limit on a short circuit is so close to crashing mm -hmm. 
then you cannot do that yeah. on a road circuit. Yeah. You know? Um. Sorry, I've, I uh, did. We get to when? When did you retire? What year did you retire? Um, not sure what year it was, but it was. I come back to England when when I'd done MotoGP. Um. I don't, I don't know the years now, but yeah. uh, I did MotoGP anyway, and then uh, I did the Elf, I did Suzuki, uh, you know, in the MotoGP stuff, you yeah. know. And then after Suzuki, I come back to England on the Norton. And to be oh, fair, yes. in my head, it was like, okay, I'm not going to get to the top of MotoGP, you know, but now I want to enjoy myself. I still love riding bikes. So to get the opportunity to come back and ride the Norton in, in England, English bike, English crowd. I thought, yeah, me riding on that, fantastic. So come back to England and, and rode the Norton, which that was good. That was good, you know. But I think I got a bit of a, I don't know. I've been doing GPs on GP bikes and all that stuff. To come back to England, I just took took it as a, a lower level, you know, from where I was, mm -hmm. you know. Well, it is a tier system. Yeah, no yeah I, I, I thought you know it was a lower level. But what you don't realise is... It's a lower level on machinery, but not so much on riding. You know, like so your riding's still as strong. So I dropped back to this Norton expecting to wipe the floor with everybody basically. The first race we did at Brands Arch, they set off and I'm in like about, I don't know, eighth, ninth position and check a flag come out. They're so short of racers. I thought, shit, what happened there? <laughs> you know, like, you know, I was still about eighth or ninth, you know, and then like I'm sort of building up, you know, but it race is done, you know. And it made me realise then is I still got to ride as hard as what I would at MotoGP. Because purely the level of bikes come down a bit. So you had to you had to find that out of it. So and the Norton was very different. And did you just do that for like a year or two or something? I did uh, Norton a couple of years. I broke my leg on the Norton, um, that was Snetterton, sixth gear. Um, the gearbox locked up on it, uh, throw me over the top, uh, and then chuck me in front of the bike. And I'm sliding down the track as happy as a lot, sliding, can see everything happy. You know, slide, okay, I'm gonna get some grazers, but you know, it's not a bump. You know, and the next minute, a great big black shadow come over my head, ah. the bike landed straight on my leg, uh, bottom of the leg, broke the leg. We didn't just break it, did it? The bloody thing broke, bone come out, and it filed two inch off onto our mic, filed it away. Yeah, two two inch, two inch off the bone, straight off, all the way down the tarmac. So I got to the end, and my legs folded back in. There's a bone sticking out with two inch gone off it. How did oh, they fix shit. that? Just a rod. The rods in the museum. In the uh, museum, yeah, yeah. But the bone will just naturally gap. Yeah. Right. So Incredible, all they did, they drilled it all in my knee. The surgeon that I've told you that I'm um, unbelievable. Yeah. Um, drilled it all in my knee, put a rod down it, um, <laughs> stuck a rod down and spaced it out and put screw two screws in the bottom the antle and two in the top stop it rotating you know otherwise it would have rotated on the round rod mm -hmm. you know and they just fired it in that left it open because that was weird that war i was in hospital i think it was three weeks and first week they just left it completely open nothing on it so you could physically see the end of the bone and the bar and everything you could whittle your toes you could see everything moving Wow. Like, oh, Jesus. You know, like, wow. I thought this is never going to heal. You know, it was like one of these you see on these films, these bionic men type thing, you know, you see a bar and freaking bits. And then it only took a few days and all the, it sounds bad, it looks like bleed gangrene. All the fuss comes over it, you know, and it seals it. And and it, and it every time they used to come in, and because it was like a, a greeny fuss that come over, they used to come in and get a bloody hard brush and scrub it off. So newness would come again, you know, like, uh, you know, the redness and that. Every bloody night. I dreaded them coming through the door, knocking on doors. I knew what I knew what they're coming for. <laughs> Mr. You know, Haslam? Like, oh, yeah, oh Jesus, you know. But I did that in there for three weeks and they did all that and once it had done most of the healing, then they put bone graft to it. So they took a load of bone off me hip and chucked it all in the front, you know, and then did a bone graft to it. Incredible. But the the mistake they did, they didn't get it on around the back. So if you visualize a straight bone it was a straight bone, a two inch gap, and all the bone graft was there at the front, sort of like a C opposite way, you know, and down. There was nothing in between. Because when I seen it on the x rays, when he'd done it all, and I wrap it, I'm walking about on it, I talked to him and I says, uh, Am I all right to, like, you know, say jump off a step? Because I can see my bones not in line, it's just got a big lump in one end on it. And he says, Yeah, yeah, so you never break it. He says, you can do what you want. You know, like, wow. You know, like, yeah. But even when I got the pin in, I was a bit panicking. I think I've got a pin in here. Um, 
And I said to myself, what happens? I says, if I fall off and I I bend the pin, you know, I snap me like and bend the pin. And they were dead good, you know, the sage. He says, it don't matter, does it? He says, well, just put another one in. I said, but it goes in the centre of your bone, you see. I said, well, how the hell are you going to get the pin out? It's bent. I said, no, it's easy. He says, I'll just cut it and pull the two bent bits out. They were like, what are you doing in your wake shop? <laughs> you're like, you're like, if you're doing something in your wake, you said, yeah, no, no, I'll just cut your wake's bent and pull both bits out. It's got his apron on, tab on. Yeah, I know. You're like, wow. Off you go, I'll tell you what, it gave me so much confidence to say, you know, when he talked to you, it was so like, yeah, not a problem. You're like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, um, <laughs> I guess going, going from like, focusing on your own racing career to then uh, sort of bringing Leon through the ranks and from the sort of CB500s, yeah. uh, Leon had a very, a little bit like yourself, had a very fast acceleration ride to the pinnacle of the sport and was in GPs when he was, was he about 17 or 18? 17, yeah. Riding a 500cc yeah. yeah. two-stroke. Yeah. Two stroke. The hardest bike to ever ride. Was that, oh, was that a bit mad yeah. as, a, as a dad? <laughs> The problem I got there is um, you never miss opportunity and opportunities arise for him where he could move on. So he did 125 in England. From 125, he got a MotoGP ride on 125 on a Talijet, which for factory bike, worst thing we ever did. They was new into the sport, mm. didn't know what the elder was doing. Absolutely nearly wrecked him. Kept seizing up, chucking him off, seizing up, chucking him off. I had a bit of experience with two strokes and all that, and I knew it would happen. So my job then, because it's the factory, I'm not a lad, I'm a dad, interfering dad. So I, I didn't, you know, I'm standing back, didn't do it. So I'm seeing my lad go out on that bike, knowing it's going to chuck him off. I can't say, you know, because anything I'd say, I'd be the normal motocross dad. Yeah. You know. um, so that was hard, knowing that Suzuka won't go, um, on the two strokes, the Italijet, so any two strokes, you had what you call a detonation light. And that tells you if it flashes a lot, it means it's too lean, not enough fuel, it's going to seize. And this light on his warm up lap in at uh, Japan Suzuka, the light was flashing that much, it looked like it was on comp- continuous. And the chief mechanic, and I says, you know, I'm on the grid, I'm saying, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to put a bigger chair? Oh, no, 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 no. Piece of tape covered the light up. Just covered the light up so you couldn't see it. Third lap, sixth gear, absolutely end of end, lock solid. I bet that was terrifying as a dad. I, I knew, I knew. I'm on the grid. I it. Can't do it. I'm going, wow. You know, like, I know, I know what's going to happen. You know, like, as soon as he didn't come around, I thought, I know what's happened. I just hope that it's locked up and it's just come to a stop. Slid off, yeah. Nah, nah big what? fast sweep. What? what, what? Uh, <laughs> yeah, so. Yes, I had the opportunity to shove him forward in a 125 class where he'd been on 125s in England. Big mistake because the team wasn't, even though it was a factory team and you can say, oh, what you want about it, never did hope. Um, and uh, I did the same thing, but I didn't give him enough experience. I got him, I got him from there uh, into 500 Twins GP stuff. Again, Rossi, you know, when Rossi was coming through, you know, like... But I mean, Leon was like way lower, you know, not on that. Because I can always remember one of the things he'd probably tell you about it as well. It was at uh, one of the circuits with Rossi there. And he'd just come from 125s and all this. So loads of corner speed and all that stuff. And he went out there and he says, he come in. He says, oh, dad, he says, I can't believe it. He says, I nearly took Rossi out. I says, what? He says, he is shit on, a, on corner speed. He says, it's useless. He's got no corner speed. I said, all oh, right. I says, um, what lap times he done? <laughs> oh, yeah, he's four seconds faster than me. Huh? Yeah, there's probably a reason for that, you know, then why he ain't got that corner speed there. You know, like, so he's trying to tell me that he's nearly at Rossi because he's got no corner speed. Well, Leon's come from a 125 where you need to carry shitloads of corner speed. And obviously, the big bike, you, you stop and turn, fire him out the other end. Yeah. Uh, so that were new to Leon, but his, he was believing that Rossi <laughs> was shit. Was shit, he got no corner <laughs> speed. And I said, yeah, but just, just get your sheet. Get your sheet, look. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. so his free garage is down, son. You just go tell him <laughs> yeah, he's yeah. over there. Have, <laughs> have you always been, uh, like, sort of, in all the way through Leon's career, have you always been the sort of spotter type figure with yeah. your cameras and, like, helping him? All, all the while, all the way through. Um, I've learned, I learned for every team, because I've been in every team I go to, you have to 
show that you're not a motocross dad. So you have to do nothing, you know, stat back, don't talk, don't denote, you know, even when you know this thing's a little bit art, you know, you can't say oh. And I learned that dead early on, you know, no, because they all expecting the motocross dad to come in. Mm. My son's the best. You know, why are you doing this for him? Why are you doing that for him? You know, so I didn't do any of that because you'd get the reputation of it, you know. But no, I helped him out as much as I could. So I always used to talk to him after the practice, you know, um, he'd practice, then we'd clear on and he'd say, what do you think? I'd be watching him with cameras. I'd say, well, okay, such and such is doing it like this, or, you know, you, you're coming in too fast, or you're not coming fast enough, whatever it was, you know, um, or your line's wrong or something. So I get him little ins, um, and you always hate to give him, you can't tell him how to ride, it's impossible. You can just tell them what other people's doing. Yeah. Mm. And, you know, can you do that? You might, they might go, oh, well, I can't go any faster through that corner because my bike won't do it because the bike's not set the same. Mm -hmm. But I can probably break harder going in, you know, so I'll gain on the way in, but I can't get through it as fast. So you never ever say, go faster here or do that. Yeah. You just say, well, you're losing a bit on brakes or you're losing a bit on entrance a bit here. And then it's down to him to see if he can you know, compensate or do something about yeah. the job. You know, so that, that that's how we always work. Do you know, over all of the years of um, of being in Leon's dad, what's been your proudest moment? Ooh, I like that. Yeah. Um, like that. To be fair, I, I've, he's not here, so I'm not going to tell him that because we never, <laughs> I never bully him up at all. You know, like... Um, like a dad, you mean? <laughs> yeah, never bully him up at all. Uh, as, a, as an example... Um, I think the proudest moments are is it's continuous is determination uh is will to win um yeah it's everything I think that's the proudness I get for him you know like he, if he falls off and hurts himself I know for a fact he's brave brave enough or whatever you want to call it confident enough, he can go just as hard again he's got that willpower that that confidence that that's the what I'm proud of her. You know, he's mm -hmm. like, wow. I'm the opposite end of it. Um, I've never ever given him any uh, bullshit confidence, if you know what I mean. <laughs> uh, I've always, anytime he comes in, I will never tell him how good he was on breaks or whatever. I'll tell him how bad he was somewhere else because that's where he needs to improve. He doesn't need to improve where he's good. You know, that's, that's done, that's finished. But if he's lacking somewhere else, that's the first thing I'll tell him. And it was Alton Park once. Um, it'd gone through a bad spell with that Italia jet, 125 stuff, crashing a lot. So I had to then pull him back to England and do some England rounds to get his confidence back because he, mm. he didn't have it, you know, that Italia jet was chucking him off every every meeting. So I thought, all right, come back to England, got my own bike, uh, did some champ uh, British Championship rounds on it. Went to Alton Park and uh, I know he could have won the race easy. You know, so it went out there and you've got to realise it'd been finishing near the back in the GP, 125 GP stuff. Uh, went to Alton Park, as happy as out after a race because it had a big battle leading it. Uh, and then the last lap, he got mugged and uh, it dropped a third. Yeah. They shoved him out, basically shoved him, shoved him out. Yeah. And uh, he come in and we in the holding there and Anne's there laughing you know it's mine because he's got a result he's, you know, he's got something there and uh, Anne went mad at me because I went up to him and I says and he's, and he's looking at me like, if there's I think to give him praises and I went that's shit <laughs> you know and he looked at me and I says you shouldn't even be there I says you should have been half a lap clear I says you're riding to what they ride in you're not riding to what you can ride you know, I says, you can ride faster than that. I know you can, you know. I said, I says, I says, so as far as you saying that they shove you out the last lap, that's your fault. I says, because you shouldn't, it shouldn't even have been there. And this is like the biggest comeback from his, from his confidence. But, and, and, and there's dad. Yeah. I says, look, I says, don't copy them. I says, you're copying them. I says, you're going out, then you're copying them. I says, ride what you know. Ride the bike. How you feel it can be rode, the limits of the bike, this. I said, do that. I says, and see what happens, you know. So, uh, Anne, his mum, went, she, she got me to one side. She went ballistic at me. Jesus Christ, you just had a result from doing all this and all that. I said, look, I don't care. I know it's better than that, you know. Uh, and he went out next race, Alton Park. He won it way off a lap. He, I says, and it's just purely, he didn't copy them. He copied them and battled with them. 
I said, don't. Just ride the bike. How you know it should be road? You know, forget that. And he just cleared off and went easy. So it made up for it. Because yeah. then I said, I, he come in then looked at me and I says, that's what I'm on about. And you're like, I know you. I know your level is better than what that was. Mm-hmm. You know. What was the best bit of advice you got? Me. And who from? I told you the early on with Barry Sheen, calm it down when I was too airy. Yeah. You know, too airy and crashing a lot. That was not at the time I didn't take it. But after I realised, yeah. uh, it was yeah good advice. You know, so that was I would say that was the best one I got because that's mm. when you you get to the point where you think you're better than everybody. So you push, you push, you push, you make mistakes, crash, and you're pushing too hard. You know, uh, instead of dropping it back a bit, getting a bit more mileage under you. When I say mileage, laps, I'm talking. I'm not talking meetings. You know, and then trying to push it a bit further after that. Well, you, when you're doing that, you don't. You go out these young. You go out there, second lap, you're trying as hard as you can go, aren't you? You're just trying to find, you know, and the limits come at you very fast, mm. you know, like, and the limits, because they come at you fast, you mostly cock up and slip up, you know, where Barry Sheen says, no, he says, just go at it a bit slower, build it. And that that was, I would say, the best advice I've ever seen, ever known, you know. And when you see the up-to-date riders, you know, you good riders, they're happy to sit in fourth, fifth, and they'll just get faster and faster. Uh, and then they'll be on it at the end, you know. Uh, so the advice, they they realise that early, you know, where, yeah. No, I'd say that one was a good one for me. And uh, these days, do you, uh, do you travel around with Leon quite a lot? Well, Mostly everywhere, yeah. Um, very rare that I'm not there on a test day or whatever. Um, again, sometimes it sounds bad, I'm not needed. Um, but I think Leon just wants me there as a comfort sometimes, because uh, Leon, to be fair, he knows lot, lots. He knows he's, he's been in it a long time. He knows setups. He knows and all that. So, but then there's always the unknown when you're on the track. It'll get to a point where you know he's stuck on a lap time, and he wants a bit of I won't say guidance. Like, well, where is it? You know, is it brakes? Is it, is it the bike? You know, is it the tires? You know, and then he'll look to me like, you know, what, you know, where is it? What's happening? You know, why aren't uh, you know that point two or three quicker? You know, mm-hmm. and uh, so again, I'm still in this mode of I never give him praise. I'm only telling him where he can probably improve himself. Yeah, I don't tell him how to improve it. I just say it's happening in this area. Yeah, you know, and it's down to him if he can do all about it. What um. What do you think's been the best uh, as over a season? What do you think the best season Leon's ever had performance wise? Um, he did really well on a, the well. He's done well on the the superbike stuff. You know the British. He won the British, obviously, which took him a bit to do. Yeah. Um, mainly because I've moved him on too quick. Well, too quick. I've moved him on because the opportunities have been there. You know, the four-cylinder Honda was there, the two-cylinder Honda was there, the four-cylinder Honda was there. So because it was there, I went, go. Because, okay, you're going to start at the back again, but you're going to learn. it's the next, yeah, it's the you're learning from people now that's like better than where you've been, you know, and, and it's the next step up. So I think the hardest bit on that when you're saying that is I never let him get what I call... Um, win championships and stuff. I never let him get to that stage. Before we actually got to the point where if he goes in it next year, he will win it. No, moved, moved on. So he he always got the bloody step, the step, the step. So he he did well to keep his motivation there. Yeah. You know because he didn't have the one. Oh God, I'm I'm one two five champion three times or multiple three. He never got any of that. Mm-hmm. You know, like it was always no step up, step up, step up. I think I think for for me, you know, when he's um, he was on the Suzuki in World Superbikes. Yes, and he was like he almost won the championship one year on the Suzuki. That was the best ride he's ever done. Yeah, that's right. what I was going to say. Oh, that's for, what you're after. Yeah, yeah, yeah To that's... be honest, yeah, the best ride I have ever, ever seen him ride. Where went to Phillip Island. Um, on the Suzuki, and I'm not joking. He even come in early on practice. Practice. He didn't do all the practices because he says no need, Dad. He says I'm I'm all right. He says everything's good. He says uh, yeah, confident with it. And he obviously won it. He won the race though as well. And it was just one of them jobs where he knew that you know it got it in hand. It got it in hand, and it were like I think the bike the team. He just knew how to ride it, whatever you want to call it. You know, he just 
they were good on it. You know, mm. and that year, he was so I don't know pleased. Uh, I'm not pleased. He was so confident with it. You know, he he knew that it won't sometimes win, but then you're good at the next one. He'll he'll know that it's going to win. Mm. You know, like he 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 got that that level. Mm. You know, uh, which was fantastic. Do you know, as a more, oh, we've got a few Patreon questions by the way, which I'll get on to, but. Yeah. Um, just a question of from me. Do you know, just in general, like if you think about how um, sort of satisfied you are with uh, what you've done in your life and like how things have have gone, you could. It's very easy, and every single person always thinks like, "I could have done." They, they always think like things could have been a bit better, and things. Um, like say out of ten, one to ten, how uh, sort of satisfied are you right now with like how? How everything's gone. Yeah. yeah. Um, everybody can say it. In my career, for me, uh, you're never satisfied. Yeah. I wanted to win every race, every MotoGP. You know, and it, uh, I struggled. I got, I think, I think my best result was fourth, uh, joint fourth with Wayne Gardner in the championship. That was my best result. I got a lot of rostrums, got second spots, but I never actually won a GP, you know, which that was my disappointment, mm. you know. You had a pole position, didn't you? Pole position, beat Freddie Spencer. Pole position. Uh, beat me uh, teammate. Yeah, yeah beat so me he's teammate. Done it, pole he's position, done it. everything, yeah. <laughs> and you've always got the odd look stories, haven't you? I mean, that one when I got pole position, it was three so non Um So confident. I'd got that race easy. No problem whatsoever. Set off, uh, pulled off a lap on everybody. You know, um, over half distance, still pulling on them. And then, yeah, I've got it. I've won it. It's done, finished. You know, Spencer was second. Uh, I've got it dead easy. One of them days, uh, yeah, I've, I've, I'm, this is my first win. I've got it. Friggin' temperature gauge climbed up, oh. kept getting higher and higher. The bike got slow and slow and slower, and then it finished up. I crossed the line, it seized. But I crossed the line, but it seized. Yeah, <sighs> so like, wow, okay, I would have won that one confident in my bayan. I didn't win it, you know, problem. Mm -hmm. South Africa in the wet. Um, three cylinder under again. I was that lucky where I'd been practicing two weeks before that and it was absolutely pickling down with rain. You know, like, so I practiced in the wet, you know, f I don't know, three, four days, you know. So I got so good in the wet there. Come to wake in the better, got it. GP come there. I'm in the GP, qualified wherever, middle pack or whatever it was. Uh, just we're going to the line. Nobody's had no wet. Boom, rain. Nobody's had no expectors. <laughs> but, right, I know where I am here. You know, so they let everybody about four laps and then straight to line. Oh, Jesus. I set off. Middle pipe, the bike won't run. It's misfiring. It's doing all this. I'm thinking, oh, shit. It cleared. As soon as it cleared, coming through like mad. I mean, really fast. You know, like, because I knew it wet. I knew there were rivers going across or everything and I knew how to cross them and everything. So I'm, I'm somewhat like about three seconds a lap faster than Eddie Lawson that were leading it. Coming through, coming through like mad. I got about eight laps in, uh, like that first turn, started to lay into it because it kept misfiring and coming back. Laying it in, bloody thing seized up, didn't it? Oh. <laughs> Come round, down I went. And the worst bit on that, this is HRC Honda, uh, Japan. Come in and, oh yeah, yeah, sorry. Sorry, Ron San, they said, sorry about that. Uh, you know, you know, you was coming through. Uh, but you could see in the eyes that they thought I was going too fast. That's why I've crashed. Yeah. And I went, oh, yeah, we're behind the garage doors now. So you don't know. And I says, uh, no, no. I says, your bike seized. What? I says, your bike seized. Are you sure? I says, sure. Your bike seized. I said, what means the bike seized? Oh, okay. Right, and it's three cylinder. You got two on the top, one underneath. Yeah, so I'm in the garage because yeah, they don't believe me. You know, they just think because I've got like three seconds on the leader coming through. You know, so they're just thinking, nah, it's way too quick. You know, and they just made it seized. You know, and that's it. Pulled the top two off. Perfect. Nothing wrong. I thought, oh shit, I'm going in my head now. Well, did, it, did it, it felt seize? like yeah, it felt like it, felt like it seized. <laughs> it definitely seized. It locked up on the way in. I'm going like, I know it has. Bottom cylinder, they pulled it off. Best thing I've ever seen. Alloy all stuck to the head, seized up. And that's the first time I've wanted a bike to be seized. <laughs> you know, like, because all the Japan then, they went, ah, oh. as soon as they knew then what that had caused it, 
the Japanese are so passionate. They come to me, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, Ron, I'm sorry, so I'm sorry. It's our fault, not your fault. I thought, I know that. You thought it were me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, yeah, so there was like real apologetics. So again, that's another one that I might have won. Yeah. Yeah. So if, if you, uh, just, it's just your career say how satisfied My, my like, career, yeah, like I, one to ten. I, I, had a, I think I got to probably about eight, to be honest, one to ten. I, feel, I think I got to Can ten, I just tell you about um, eight? Most people listening to this, there'll yeah. be like loads of people around your age that are like hero worshipped you. Yeah. And like yeah. they'll just think that's crazy. But I, I think everyone, I think, do you know, what, if you ask most people how satisfied they are with their life right now, I think a lot of yeah. people would say between seven and eight. Yeah. I don't think many, it doesn't matter who you are, I don't think many people no, would say always, nine or ten. You always feel like you could have done better. Yeah. You, know, you always feel that way. So, yeah, you put as much effort as you can in. So, you do put, you know, you can't put no more effort in. But as far as being satisfied, mm. you always want to be better. I think if you if you did a um, a Johnny Ray win all them championships, mm-hmm. you, you still, still won't be more. satisfied. You want one more. Yeah, <laughs> You're like, yeah, exactly. You know, don't you? So well, I think that that's the that's the level of it. Yeah, I'll um, I'll just get while he's loading up questions. There, you got any good Macau party stories? Well, my last one on one was on the Elf, wasn't it? Uh, not party stories; it was the race. Oh. Um, <laughs> so it's not a party story, but it was the actual race and. Uh, Sage Rossi was the manager of the Elf project. Well, the yeah. Elf project, it didn't really get as good as what we thought. You know, okay. uh, it was all right. You know, but it didn't. You know, it, it didn't get into MotoGP's. We everybody and all that. So, so yeah. Okay. So they went to Macau with, with me, and this is the proper Elf. It's not a copy. It's a proper Elf. And uh, I won the race. Uh, I think it was Joey. Joey Dunlop was second, and uh, it must have been. A lap and a half to go, my board come out because I've got a big lead on the elf, and it's like, wow, it's going to be the elf's big win, Macau GP. And the manager says, Ross has got the board out, hanging over the barrier, going, showing up, and going like, slow down, slow down. In other words, there's so much wanting the win, you know, because it's one more lap to go, slow down, slow down. And uh, anyway, I come around and uh. I finished, I finished up, I crossed the line. And as I crossed the line, Joey Dunlop passed me like half a wheel, but I just crossed the line. So I, I beat him with half a wheel. And I'd got, I'd got nearly half a lap on him, you know. And uh, anyway, I come around to the manager, Sage Rossi, and uh, he says, I didn't mean, I didn't mean he to slow down that much. He says, God, you nearly lost it. You know, but he's happy that he, you know, that he'd done that. And I'm sort of there looking at him. I says, no, Sage, there's no cameras or that. I says, Sage, I says, the handlebar snapped off on the brake the last lap you know before i got to the line the handlebar snapped off the brake bit it snapped completely in my hand with the throttle throttle brake everything's in my hand like that it's just snapped off the bar that you know, i had to do like one off laps that's why i i didn't slow down what he says i still couldn't go any quicker you know just jam the handlebar i jammed it in the bloody fair in there leaned on the tank and just had to i had to put it the hardest bit but to accelerate you had to roll with your thumb, put your hand on top of the brake and roll it round, you know, to, to make it go. You know, like, and then when you try to brake, you had to lean on the tank because you just fell over at front because you got no to hold on, you know. And I did one and a half laps, but because I got a big lead, I, I mean, like I, I was slow. Joey caught me all the way back up again and we crossed the line. I beat him with freaking nothing hardly. And he gave me the biggest look. You shouldn't have slowed down that. I said, and I said to him, it's an antlebar snap. And I'm trying to be quiet because this is the elf project. You know, like, so we don't want any bad publicity, I'm thinking. As soon as he knew that, he went straight up to the bike, got the handlebar out and showed no press. Look, look here, we've won it with one handlebar. You know, like, opposite to what I was trying to do. <laughs> you know, like, I'm like, you know, you're normal. You know, you, you don't get bad bad publicity, you know. Turn the line. But yeah, but no, he freaking he didn't. He got it and said, look here, he says, we've still won look, one handlebar. <laughs> You know, like, yeah. Class. Oh, yeah. uh, we've got a few Patreon questions. We're first one, NK. Is there any plans in the future for yourself or even Leon to start up the race school again? Mm, good question. Yes, there is. Uh, there's quite a few happening. Um, <clears throat> it won't be as it was. Um, so, first, Jonathan Palmer, you know, he's on about trying to start it up. So, he's going to be the financial backer and we're going to sort of run it for him. That's one plan, but it's not It's not a definite thing. Yeah. Um, I want to go to Ireland uh, and do uh, some over in Ireland where I'll take a few instructors uh, and you bring your own bikes. So it's not a track day, but it's more you bring your own bike and we sort out. So that's another thing that's... Is that Bishop's Court or...? It's uh, where the sunflower is. You know, the, Bishop's Court, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Bishop's Court. We're on about 
we're on about doing that so we, we're talking about that at the moment uh, i'd like to do that because that's like that i'd would, enjoy that that know? would go down a treat you know because yeah. we get a lot of a lot of uh, yeah. irish listeners and they'll be like oh you, yeah. you've got you can't let them down now ron no, you can't let them down no no well that's that's <laughs> i'm hoping to do that uh I've had that much on with Leon's team at the moment. I had a chance, we had a chance to do, you know, yeah. to, to expand to that. We haven't, we haven't even mentioned the whole affinity thing. Ever. No, it's no, the affinity and all that. That's I'm doing. Busy. Uh, I'm helping a lot with Leon on that side because Leon's riding himself, so I'm trying to take a bit of weight load off him basically. Yeah. Um, and the other one is uh, we've got a big offer from abroad uh, to do one. Brilliant. Uh, yeah, a massive one. We can't say much about that yet, but uh, it's big. It's government funded. Uh, they want us to go over there and teach them how to ride bikes because they're getting too many deaths on the roads. So, and that's that's uh, but that's like got to look at that because it's a massive project. We've got yeah. passports, we're available, yes. you know, yeah, to... yeah, yeah, yeah. If yeah. you need any instructors, yeah. Yeah. so there, there is three three projects that we're looking at. Um, yeah, at the moment, we've got to get uh, Leon's team a bit more self running, yeah. You know? yeah. Um, and then when that does, I will start looking at the other end. Class. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, Never a dull moment at the, house, uh, the uh, Haslam household. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jesse Mortimer, favourite track to ride a 500 two-stroke? 500 two-stroke. Um, Donington's a nice one, 500 two-stroke, because you've got some nice flowing corners, change directions and stuff like that, which is, which is nice. So... <clears throat> I'd put it on. I'd put Donington. You know, Donington or Assen. Yeah, Assen's nice. Uh, Assen's a beautiful track to ride. Mm. You know, uh, between them two. Class. Yeah. Uh, good question by Sam Downs. Uh, do you fancy doing the Ducati Cup? <gasps> uh, Imagine how that I would know. go down. It Ron be, Haslam's yeah, return to Ducati. Yeah. Oh, that would be mental. I, I wouldn't mind it. Uh, I think the biggest hurdle I'd get is actually Anne. The missus, you know, she would be a bit uh, upset about it because uh, she wants me to just retire, basically. Um, <laughs> uh, but no, I'm not ready for retiring yet. You know, <laughs> like, you know so uh, yeah, it's an option. Yeah. Um, Class. At the moment, I am going on a bit. Uh, so the old joints and bones ate a bit. Hmm. Um, if, if there was a Ducati, uh, like say, a Ducati Triaptions team that or we're listening and they've got a ride in the what like would you would you actually be up for it maybe doing a wild card or doing yeah, yeah. wild card and that'd be good oh, I'd yeah. absolutely love It'd to be see nice, that. yeah well, like we're, that. we'll yeah. never be allowed back on the farm Anne's going to go you two off that's <laughs> it you know what I mean? yeah. the phone's yeah. just going to ring and ring oh, and ring yeah. and ring and ring yeah <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> that would be amazing he's even smiling yeah. thinking yeah, about it get, yeah. get well, this yeah. Yeah. get this man on Ducati Keith, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Keith Fletcher he's got three questions first one is Ron's favourite bike he rode in the days will you your favourite 500 that you rode three cylinder Honda uh, it was the NS not the RS RS was the production bike mm. of what you could buy NS was the factory bike and it was slightly different on the frame uh, made it a lot nicer to ride so mm. yeah three cylinder Honda in the 1980s who would you say that the th like over that era who were the three best 500 riders there was a lot to be fair there uh, in the 80s so that would be Lawson in that area wouldn't they uh, Eddie Lawson in the eighties, yeah. Uh, Eddie Lawson was I respected a lot of Eddie Lawson because you get riders that's got natural ability, and you've got riders that work at it. You know that you know the work to get the result they after. Yeah. Uh, Eddie Lawson was one that knew where he wanted. You know he changed his bike, alter his bike, uh, and get where he wanted to be. You know so Lawson comes comes eye up uh, there. Um, it is rainy, rainy. I know we always act and Wayne rainy. He, he was uh, just a hard rider, you know. He would he would push till he till he made it, you know. Which yeah, so rainy was a, a big one for me as well. Um, and the eighties would be Spencer as well, didn't they? Because I was a teammate. Spencer was a natural, you know. So yeah, them three was was you know the top of the list job, you know. All because they're all slightly different in the ways, you know. Yeah. You know, it, it's interesting how you've put it like that. You know, you've got the natural ability and the lads who work at it. Yeah. Which one were you, in your opinion? I had a slight bullheadedness as far as if it weren't fast enough, I'd go faster, which I'd made mistakes, which was wrong, but I didn't know at the time, you know, so that was that. And to finish up, I would just try and ride the bike on how it wants to be rode 
So when you say natural ability, I try and adapt to the bike. You know, oh, so instead of trying to make the bike better, I try and get around it. You know, so when you say natural ability, I'd say there's a little bit of that trying to get into it. You know, hmm. um, so yeah, my mistake was sometimes if I wasn't quick enough or I needed to be point two threes or whatever quicker, my mistake I would just do it not knowing what the end result was going to be, you know, which that was a mistake, really. I should have changed the bike a little bit, got a bit more confidence or done summit to to make it happen. Yeah. yeah. And I didn't. I just, I've got to go quicker and that's it. <laughs> you know? The uh, last question, Mike Orton. So uh, we've got a bit of a running theme on the podcast. We'll always ask. <laughs> yeah. the, um, what's the most embarrassing moment of your life? Funnier the better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um... There's not been that many to be fair on that. There's not been I've not been that 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 bad. Um I think uh it sounds bad this and I shouldn't say it. Um Isla Man, when I won it the first time, um again it took off me on stage. Cause I did, I got it took off me. Uh that was embarrassing. Um eh? Yeah, I uh, the first time I say I won Isle of Man twice, but in the records it'd be once. Um Right. Yeah, the Isle of Man, I, I won it with Onda the first time I'm saying I've won it. And I won it with over a minute. You know, this is Formula One. Mm. And got the laurels, got on the rostrum, everything perfect. No problem. Then the night time come when you go down to the thing and get on stage. Don't the Ville Marina at the front. Yes. Aye, aye. And they shouted me up for second spot, not the win. And I went, I went up on stage and I was like, no, no, I've won it. And I was practically arguing, like, nah, I've won it. And that was quite embarrassing because you've got all the crowd there, you know. No, no, you didn't. How was... quiet was that crowd? I bet that was... Oh, yeah. No, there was nothing happening. Was Jesus. Like, wow. You know, this was that. That was embarrassing for me. Uh, and long story short, Graham Crosby, that was riding at that, that time, missed his slot on the on the start, you know, it right. rising start. So he had to go to the back of the grid. Yeah. In the rule book... It says if you miss the start, you go to the back of the grid, mm -hmm. but you lose the time, what you've got. And they reckon that it beat me with two seconds only. Uh, yeah, I thought I was a minute ahead. So from lap, after lap one, I backed it off. And they ah. says it, it beat me with two seconds because they're getting his time back. But in the rule book, it says no. If you miss your gap, you're off at the You lose the time. You lose the time where you should have set off. So I went in that race all the way through it very slow as I can, trying to not break the bar, like don't rev it and wouldn't it as slow as I could. That's what you do. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, as I say, I did that. And even Honda thought they'd won it, you know, because Honda protested mass about it. I don't know if you can remember when Honda painted all the bikes black, you know, Isle of Man. Painted everything black. And was that a protest at that? A protest on that. Was it? Yes. Right. Because uh, at one stage, when they first heard about it, Japan phoned through to us, Honda Britain, the, the Honda team, and says, Pull all your bikes out of the other man. We've finished. Not going there again. You know, that, that was under. That was under Japan. Mm -hmm. And then the TT people must have phoned Japan up because then they had come to agreement that, you know, okay, um, we'll protest. So then under Japan phone does up and says, right, everything, black leathers, black bikes, black everything, just to say you're wrong, you know, what you've done. And that's what we did. And there were me, Joey Dunlop, and Alex George. In we had to have leathers made that night, all in black. You know, the bikes, all these beautiful colour bikes, black paint, black paint, them all black. Everybody did, yeah, because Honda was going to pull out completely. How mad's that? Yeah, and that was just purely that it was their fault. You know, they if it's in black and white, yeah, it's in, in black and white in the book. And the worst bit of it is, you see, this says, well, you never protested. You know, under, you know, they never protested because I think it's 30, 30 minutes after the meeting. You've got you've got 30 minutes to protest. Well, then you're on the top of the step. We're screaming nope. up and down with water. No, nobody told us. <laughs> nobody told us till the night that we come on stage and said, oh, no, you haven't. Oh, oh. <laughs> it's a good job there wasn't Twitter then, imagine. All that. <laughs> yeah, and that, that was that was the big protest wow. on that side. Now, to, go on. Directing social media has ruined the sport in some ways. Uh, it's a random question. Yeah, 
No, I think I think you get good and bad all around, yeah. don't you? On it, you <laughs> know. So sometimes, yes, it it doesn't help, you know. Mm. Uh, but then you get the other side where it, it, it's it does. So yeah. no, that's that thing now. It's. Yeah, you're always, you're, he, always, you're always going to get it. You know, of course, it yeah. matter. No, it was just yeah. interesting when he said Twitter. You're like, actually, you know, yeah. there are good yeah. and bad points of it all. No, there is, yeah. yeah. And just um, one last thing for to finish up on from me. So, of um, of all your sort of qualities and like what's like um, brought you through your life, what what do you think's the what do you think's like your best quality as a person? His hair. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a yeah. thick. But that is a thick mop of hair, man. Yeah, <laughs> nah, we we're lucky in this family. All us families kept us here, so that's good. You know, that, that's you want to gene it, bottle it, Definitely. sell it. There. Yeah, yeah. So that that's a big one. Um, <laughs> no, it's like I don't know. Uh, on that side, it's. I think I've never been bothered about what the next man's got. You know, um, yes, I want to beat everybody or whatever. You know, and I always, yeah. But I've never been. I've never been like I call. I won't say jealous as. I've never been jealous as far as, uh, in a nasty sense. Jealous because I want to be that whatever whoever it is, you know. Um, but I think yeah, one one of that side of it. I've not never been that way. If if I haven't got something, then I have to work at it, or I've got to do something different, or it's not possible. You know, like me plane, fantastic. I never ever thought I'd be able to fly a plane. You know, like like too high above me for that. You know, but now I'm I'm doing it. So mm. fantastic. Yeah. Class. Class. Um, have you got anything to finish up on? No, I'm going to regret that the second I leave here because I'm like, I should have asked that, I should have asked this and everything. But like, oh, thank you so much for having us. No problem. I, I, yeah, I I've, loved it. Yeah, I've had yeah. a great time. And uh, yeah, thanks very much for your time. Just a few quick things to finish up on. Uh, I don't know if anyone's seen, we've shared it on our social pages a few weeks ago, but um, our friend Michael Booth from 44 Teeth, who had a crash at the TT, uh, he's going through a real difficult time. So if you're listening, I hope you're um, sending our best wishes, Booty. And uh, unfortunately, he's lost is one of his legs in a crash at the TT mm. and uh, there's a crowdfunding page being set up to, to help him through his difficult time mm. so if anyone does want to help him out uh, sort of share yeah, the link definitely. Uh, definitely, the other thing yeah. we've got the, the Bennett's track day coming up 27th of July and also um, a been meaning to say this for a few weeks but t- totally forgot uh, lee johnson's running a competition on his youtube channel where you can win a bike so if you right. just head over there and uh he's he's restored it and they're giving it away so you can enter that and i think that's right. everything from my end so um, <laughs> yeah in terms of racing wise so this podcast will go out next next week so we'll have a brand hatch bsb coming up and i'm just trying to think i think this weekend is the yeah it will be the weekend of the world superbikes i was about to say leon's was, leon's yeah. racing in this yes. the only time we'll see him because now yeah. he's weekend 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 so it was good to see yeah. leon today like so yeah, there you go. so uh yeah all the best with all the racing that's coming up thank you and um yeah massive thanks to our sponsors colchester kawasaki and to all of our patrons and uh we'll look forward to catching up sometime soon Brilliant. see you soon thank cheers you. mate thank cheers. you chasing the racing Powered by Colchester Kawasaki, part of the Global Moto Group. We supply new Aprilla, Moto Guzzi, Vespa, Royal Enfield, Kawasaki, Sim, Mutt and Benelli motorcycles.